Oh boy, you're going to love this episode. There's some cool information in the intro. Big reveal. Uh, it's a big deal. It's going to be fun. Also, uh, here's the giveaway. Maps Powerlift. Uh, free access to Maps Powerlift to one of you lucky viewers, but all you have to do is this in order to enter and in, in to win this potential free program. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. You got to do all those things. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to Maps Powerlift. One more thing before we get to this awesome show. We do have two workout programs that are on sale right now, 50% off. Maps Hit is half off, and Maps Split is half off. So both workout programs, half off. If you want to learn more, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com, but you have to use this code to get the 50% off discount, DEC50. So DEC50 will get you 50% off Maps Hit or Maps Split. All right, here comes the show. All right, check this out. The best tool, generally speaking, for resistance training or strength training is free weights. Generally speaking, again, it's better than machines. It's better than bands, better than cables, better than body weight. All right, guys, let's talk about this. How does that mm. comedian say it? Here's your sign. Here's your sign. Remember that one? The yeah. blue blue collar comedy guys. Oh, yeah. I don't know um, that. That's, yeah, yeah. You don't know that one? No. I yeah, know that's that. when you like when you say something like obvious. It's like, super I think that's, obvious. I think that's pretty obvious. It's you know it's not. It's controversial. It's really it's, in our space. I've I've seen people debate this before. What I think we should talk want? about why we are these say, machine people. Or yeah, typically. Yeah. yeah, cable machine people. And it, by the way, I said generally because definitely there are situations and cases where um, machines and cables are superior, but. Overall, when you're looking at, and when you have to consider the overall, right, the whole picture, function, performance, strength, muscle building. Versatility. Versatility. Uh, free weights are just, they're, they're remarkably effective. And even, and even when you compare them towards machines that are almost identical in terms of the movement pattern, like a hack squat is similar to a barbell squat. But a barbell squat is just uh, so much more effective at all those other things that I well. And do you listed. think that is mainly because of just the instability that it causes? Because when you're doing dumbbells or free barbell, like you have to balance the weight versus something being on a track. Yeah, you know, I would say so. But you know what the problem with that is? Is that you know when I was training people in the early 2000s, or well, you guys were too, the instability you know, uh, crowd went crazy, right? It was like mm -hmm. standing on wobble discs and physio balls, balls and dyna discs. And so there's definitely a, a diminishing returns with that kind of stuff. Um, and we haven't really been able to identify specifically why this anecdote is so common. Like if you talk to top coaches, trainers, if you, if you like just took a, a survey of a hundred of really, really good coaches and trainers, a majority of them would, would agree. Now, some of them would disagree, but a majority of them would, would agree. Studies can show that there's evidence to kind of support what we're talking about. Like a barbell squat tends to translate more on the field than like a leg press, for example. Um, muscle building, I don't know if there's really any studies that show what we're talking about, but there's a lot of anecdote and it's hard to explain why. My theory is that obviously our bodies evolved in the real world, in nature, and so our bodies evolved lifting free things. You yeah. know, so I think it mimics, or, or at least it, it it sets in motion adaptation processes that evolved lifting things that were more cl similar to free weights than to machines and cables. So my theory is that it's it's a lot more difficult. So the the learning curve is longer. So the the gains and or potential gains that you could get from it just are extended. So I, I think if we were to graph this and let's say you had like a free motion machine or let's just, or your, whatever your hammer strength favorite machine for like chest. Right. And then you had like a dumbbell press. I think at the beginning they would look pretty close. And then I think that you would get adapted to the machine relatively quicker, and then you would see kind of this plateau where the free weights would kind of continue. Because there's, there's less ranges of motion to consider in terms of having to stabilize and control. Right. And so I, I honestly look at it as a – if we're looking at like a signal perspective of how many muscles we need to incorporate for different tasks in each movement, each exercise – so in terms of like me doing, say, uh, an overhead press on a track, like I can, I can extend and press uh, this weight overhead, but at the same time, it's not putting as much demand laterally, uh, rotationally, uh, and also uh, stabilizing 
completely on the way down as well, which is the eccentric portion. I think there's more demand too with the freeways with gravitational force. Yeah, I'm, so okay, so I'm going to get to that because I, I love what you said and I, I got some thoughts around that. But here's something that a lot of people don't realize that's obvious. I remember learning this when I went to go buy and open my own gym. And I, you talk to machine manufacturers and you know hammer strength and all that stuff and Nautilus and all these you know Cybex. Most machines are designed around some a male who's about five ten five nine five ten. Then they have adjustable seats and arms to kind of accommodate people outside of that. But what happens when you work out with a machine is that you have to follow the machine's path and track and range of motion essentially. Free weights follow your body. So if I'm doing an overhead press with someone who's with a kid who's you know four foot ten or a, a man that's you know six foot eight, the free weights will follow them. They're not following the machine. And how many times have you guys had a client that was outside of the average? You go in a machine and it just doesn't work very well for their body, right? So there's that. And then what you said, Justin, mm -hmm. here's what's interesting about the central nervous system because that's what right that's what sends the signal for the muscles to work, right? We've used the amplifier versus the recruitment speaker. process. Yeah. When you activate the central nervous system, uh, when you activate more of it, then it, it fires harder and more effectively in specific ways. So for example, if I want to press one dumbbell overhead, but maintain a relaxed body, I'm only going to be able to press so much weight. If I tense up my entire body, mm -hmm. I can use, typically I can lift 10% or more. Power lifters know this. When powerlifters bench press, they talk about using leg drive. Like, what the hell do legs have to do with the bench press? You're just putting your legs on the ground. They're not lifting the bar. But they noticed a long time ago when they activate their lower body, they could press more weight. And free weights tends to encourage that because yeah. of that. Pro like, if I'm doing a standing overhead press, I have to tense my whole body right. just to support myself and balance. And so I'm able to probably fire more muscle fibers as a result. Like you could probably intensify your machine workouts by intentionally bracing really hard and trying to add more, um, you know, muscle tension to contribute. However, yeah, free weights are just more, they, they just place that demand naturally uh, on your body in order to be able to even maintain the certain posture and control of your body. Yeah. And I, th again, I, th I say generally, because I know there's going to be cases where someone's like, oh, I got better results using a machine um, or, you know, this leg exercise. But when well, I an train example of when that would happen is when someone's uh, when someone's form and technique is so bad on an exercise, then having a machine where you it helps you with that could accelerate their their and you can results. push harder. For example. Right, right. So there there are cases where that will make sense. But I, I again, I go I go back to I think where the real benefits kick in. It's the learning curve. I think it's that. If you were to look head to head with the, the point you guys are making with the machine and free weights, I think it would be like a little bit better at first. Like if you zero zero, no one, you've never done anything, you're just starting someone, they're brand new, yeah. And they one's doing machine exercise, the other one's doing free weight yeah, exercise. Yeah, let's compare a hack squat to a barbell squat. For right, example. right. So, and I think initially the 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 gains and results. Uh, would be pretty close. I still think free weights would be a little bit better, but it would be pretty close. I think it's where it really kicks in is over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cause because if you, put a, if you put a new client on a, a hack squat machine in a relatively short period of time in comparison to the barbell squat, they'll be able to push with maximal force. Yeah. With a barbell squat, they it's going to take a while. It's going to take a year, two years. Yeah. They could be doing that movement for years before they can even really, truly max, maximize it because it it's so challenging. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you're not getting results the whole time. Right. But yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, of all the people that I trained, um, I never saw, uh, well, I don't want to say never. Of course, there's always exceptions. But g again, generally speaking, nothing came close. And yeah. I didn't care what exercise it was. You know, even if it was a cable curl versus a dumbbell curl, as silly as it sounds, very simple, basic exercise. You know, by the way, this I had a as a kid. This is my own anecdote. I was uh, I had a dislocated my knee as a kid, and long story short, I finally decided I'm just going to go work out so I can rehab it. And and then I I was training my legs really hard. I was doing the leg press, the hack squat, the leg extension, leg curl. I was doing different uh, varieties of leg presses and hack squats in the Smith machine. And I developed, my legs built. They definitely built. And I was pushing weight, and I was pretty strong. Right? I was a 16-year-old kid, pretty strong. Then I met those power lifters, and they're like, dude, 
just barbell squat. And I swear to God, I barbell squatted and I gained 10 pounds that summer. And I'd never seen my lower body respond the way it did with all those other exercises. That was my own personal yeah. experience. Well, it was interesting because I, I remember talking to one of my clients who was always focused on Smith machine bench press and uh, just uh, was like discussing like, what's the difference? Why? Cause they, they tried like a regular barbell uh, bench press and could only do half the weight. Mm. And they were just like mystified by that. And I was a new trainer and I had a hard time kind of describing all that, but like just all those little nuanced variables of, you know, the ability for the barbell to kind of travel for, away from you, behind you, tilt, you know, all these types of, you know, things that don't seem like a lot, but when you add weight to it and you keep stacking that, that's a lot more for your body to account yeah. for. By now, the way, if, if you ever see me and I rarely ever work out in commercial gyms, usually it's a hotel gym if I'm traveling, I will use lots of machines and cables, mainly because I never do. So I work out, I'd say probably 90% of my workouts revolve around free weights. So the novelty effect is great with machines and cables. So if you see me in a commercial gym, what you'll probably see me doing or a lot of things that I don't normally do, and there's value there. There's also value in certain cases of rehab. There's certain exercises that just don't work well with free weights. Like if I'm doing a cable chop, obviously I can't, gravity doesn't work sideways, you know, tricep press down. There's certain exercises that are uh, more suited for, you know, cables and machines. Cables, by the way, are my favorite machine. They're the most versatile form of machine. What I said earlier about free weights mirroring the body and, and or the body having to calm, you know, uh, follow the track of the machine. Yeah, it moves with you. Really At well. least with cables, right? Uh, you can really adjust that for the individual. I mean, when I had my wellness studio, I had a I had a, a cage, so I had a squat rack, I had dumbbells, um, I had bands, and I had cables, and that was it. I didn't have a single machine in there, and I trained everybody that way, and it was great. And I worked out that way. That's all, and it's still to this day. Again, if you see me working out, that's pretty much what I'll what I'll be using. Now there are some studies that actually counter the point that we're trying to make right now. Um, and I, you know, people tend to jump on them, especially if you're a big machine or cable person. And that's the, uh, you know, the, the short periods where they, they, they track people for like six weeks and they're talking about muscle activation. Yeah. yeah. So you'll make this case sometimes that, oh, well, hack squat fires the quads way more than okay. and, muscles are more active. Uh, right. Yeah. With the, the, the entire time. They're right. Tense. And so they'll, they'll take that on this, this yeah. and they'll study the two groups and compare and compare them and make the case that, Hey, if you want to develop your quads, um, this machine is actually superior. And so that's why I think there is a lot of debate around this conversation, even though I think we're, initially we teased you in saying that this is obvious, but you're right. There's some contention around it or some debate. I think that's one of the reasons why there's debate is because you see these muscle activation studies that show that these muscles are firing way more on this machine, but that doesn't tell the whole story. No, right? I, the, the, there's a huge limitation with studies on this. Like, a real world, like our experience is based off of training people for long periods of time. So like you'll talk, you'll hear us talk about the value of, you know, 15 to 20 rep range or the value of one to five rep range. Well, when they do studies on rep ranges for eight weeks, you know, eight to 10 or eight to 12 builds more muscle than both of those rep ranges. However, what they don't consider in their short period, their short studies is over time, your body tends to get used to a particular rep range. And switching will get your body to move again. And all of them build muscle. So although one might be a little better in the short term, all of them still build muscle. They all have value. And so I'm talking about, you know, I trained people for years. I know you guys did too. And so that's what this is based off. This is not like I trained 15 people for three months and I found in three months that machines were as effective as free weights. It's like, no, I trained people for, I had clients with me for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And when you start training people for a long you know, extended period of times, or you work out yourself for long extended periods of time, that's when these things start to reveal themselves and you start to see, oh, I can see now the value in this way of training because although this one was great for the first six months, I started to develop some joint pain or I started to lose mobility or it really stopped working after a short period of time. Whereas this other method, you know, gave me these long-term, you know, benefits. And then the, we can't dismiss the functional aspect, right? Um, how well does the strength that you build in the gym translate into the real world? Yeah, we need, That's very, I think a lot of people are, who are just interested in, in changing how they look dismiss that 
But I'm going to tell you right now, if your function is good, the odds that you'll look good for longer periods of time are higher. Mm -hmm. So you can't dismiss that. Now, you don't have to become the super functional athlete, but don't dismiss the functional aspect because losing function will eventually take away from the aesthetics that you're trying to build. It'll, it'll definitely take away from your physique. And I look, I tell you what, fine, you can see this sometimes in gyms, these old you know, ex bodybuilders that really never learned how to train that way. And you can tell like, they're so limited with their exercises. Oh, I used to squat. I used to, and then I hurt and I can't do anymore because it hurts my back and they're very limited. And you could tell that their, their bodies start to suffer as a result of it. So, you know, keep that in mind. That includes mobility, right? Keep mm -hmm. that in mind because if that goes down, then your, you know, repertoire of effective exercises becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And what you could do to get your body to, to feel good and look good becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And then your appearance and your aesthetics start to suffer as a result. This application of, you know, advice and training is so important. Um, and the, by the way, this is one of the reasons why one of the only certifications we work with is NCI. It's not because they they communicate the best nutrition information. They but do the, have great nutrition information. Talk all information. about the application. It's about the application. Yeah. I've seen other courses, and they're really great for education. So they're going to make you really smart. But if you can't apply it, it means nothing as a trainer. I don't care how much you know. If yeah. you can't coach someone or train someone... It's uh, not going to get them closer to their re desired results. It's not going to help. And that's the entire point of why they're there. I think we lose sight of that all the time. Yeah. Well, how, how often do you guys read comments on like YouTube and our reviews and stuff like that of people that say that they've learned more from the show than they have from any of their certification they have because we speak more to the application of the science than we actually talk about the science itself yep. because you have to factor in behavioral stuff. If you're yep. not pay factoring that in, you're crazy because it's one of the biggest pieces to their success. It's if not mm -hmm. the biggest piece. Yeah. And, and you know, and ironically, certifications leave that out. They do. They don't teach. Here's two things that certifications leave out that NCI tackled, which is why I think they're growing so fast. They leave out application. Like I've done certifications. I know you guys have too. They rarely ever talk about, like they'll tell you, here's the science, but then they won't tell you, but here's what actually happens and here's right. how it affects your clients. And, and here's, here's an example of a client that has all these conditions and here's how I would appropriately kind of take them through and, and get them, you know, on a better path. Yeah. They don't, they don't do that. They just, no, they leave that just, out. Here's the science and then figure it out. Yeah. And then they also leave out the, here's how you become a successful trainer. Nobody teaches you that. Like you yeah. go get certified. None of them teach you, because here's the deal. If you're a not successful trainer, if you don't know how to build your clientele, you don't know how to organize it, manage it, you don't know how to charge the right rates, you don't know how to, you're going to fail, you're not going to succeed, then you can't train people, you can't help anybody. And certification courses spend zero time on this. There's yeah. no time spent on this at all. Which is crazy because uh, aren't these certifications trying to prepare you to be successful and actually make a career out of this long term? Yep. And you have to be able to make money. Oh, I tell you what, look, we all manage trainers. Uh, what, how, what percentage of your time was spent teaching your trainers biomechanics and science, and what percentage of your time was spent teaching trainers application and how to build their business? Yeah, 80-20. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was mostly application and how to build your business. Yeah. So NCI, they, they focus a lot of time on application and building your business, which is why people are succeeding and they're getting clients better results. And I hope other certifications take note and start to follow suit because- Otherwise, what happens? I forgot they, they when we were up there in Arizona. Didn't they tell us what the trainer dropout rate was? I think the attrition rate was like eighty percent. Oh, I don't know. What the, I mean, I, I would agree with that though. I mean, that was my probably what my turnover looked like when um, I was managing gyms. Yeah, it was a huge. Did they did they cover that? I don't they, remember. He did. Oh, yeah, I don't remember yeah. him covering that. Like a I know huge, it's even less for independent trainers once they leave like a corporate setting where you you know basically fed clients. So right, right. Yeah, I can only yeah. imagine how huge bad. dropout. Yeah, absolutely huge dropout. What other industries are like that? What are, what other industries have like really high turnover? What what else has got that, that like kind of hairstylists or uh, bartenders or uh, I mean I know for for a fact when I worked in the restaurant industry yeah hairstylists you're right I know that one's up there too I'm trying to think what other what other I bet you real estate agents mm -hmm. yeah I bet probably. you that's got a huge yeah because yeah, you go get you go get your license and everything and then you're ready to make big money and they're like oh crap this is hard mm -hmm. <laughs> I know a few people yeah. who got their real estate license did nothing I don't know I'm guessing so I have no same idea. same with life insurance agents really absolutely high turnover there too oh, yeah a lot of people say oh I can make money life insurance they do the exam the whole nine yards and then they quit yeah. I, I bet Probably you would, just sales in general then, right? Like yes. Especially highly commissioned ones Motive that rely reps. a lot on the <laughs> sale, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> sales is probably... I, I would imagine there were jobs where people thought, oh my God, it's going to be easy money 
or jobs where people were like, oh, this sounds like fun. You know, like, I love this. Like, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open a restaurant. I love cooking. And then, you know, the, the restaurant. That's always been the problem, I feel, in our industry because it always sounds like an awesome idea to live in the gym and help people out. And yeah, that's yeah. just my entire, you know, goal is to just help people. Yeah. Oh, speaking of, of gyms, um, I want I want you to tell everybody what happened with your PRX. Then they, they, they sent you what the happened? wrong weights. Oh, yeah. Dude, <laughs> what I happened? Said, well, yeah, they did. I got 25s instead of 55s. I think they know that. Which, like, he was a little ambitious. Uh, there no, you go, Justin. Give no. me the 25. Let's be honest. That's more than you need. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was teasing him like, about Well, it. I guess let's keep stacking 25s on the bar. You uh, know, no big deal. No, they, they handled it, and they're shipping me the 55s and everything. But, like, uh, yeah, I finally got everything set up on the cinder block wall. This time was a cinder block wall, which I was a little bit, like, nervous about because I hadn't done it before. I'd done it on studs before, and then I did it in here, Wait, which so how do you do it? You have to first pre-drill and then... You pre-drill and then you get a real specific type of uh, anchor bolt to um, it basically has like, I don't want to describe it. Like a thread in there. Yeah, it's like a it. thread and then it like, it, it sinks it in real tight. So it's it's a pretty secure uh, anchored in Bro, that's going to feel so solid. Solid as, as hell. Yeah. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, super solid. I better was than in here, you think? Better, way better than in here. And I, that's why I'm always like, you know, don't rip those weights off super fast. Uh, cause <laughs> it's because of the, these walls are like, like aluminum studs that are hollow. Yeah. And so there's just not a lot of security there to begin with. Cause these are, you know, for retail mm -hmm. stores, like they don't put a lot of effort in the materials. But yeah. uh, Justin could run through this wall easily. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, I, I would smash like to see right that. He could run through most walls, but yeah. this one he would. He could well, I'm through. so excited because I finally have a pull up bar. My other one didn't have a pull up bar on it. So, did you get the bigger one? Is it the yeah. same one as this one out here? The same one is out here. I love this one. Just orange, you know, and uh, looks cool. And I got two, two uh, weight trees. You know, hanging up, everything's on the wall. I have, um, I have the dip bars. I have, I actually have this cool landmine attachment they have now that you can put on the wall. Uh, and so I'm starting to do a lot of this landmine university wait, wait, stuff. Wait, wait, they have a landmine attachment that goes in the wall. Yeah, so you bolt it to the wall. So I just like shove it into the wall. And then go to town. Oh, wow. So I don't have to like set it up or put it on the rack is or it, nothing. Is it positioned for, could you do a T bar row on it too, or is it too high of for course. it? Yeah. yeah. Really? I need to find an attachment. For, I was actually thinking about that. Yeah. I'd love to do T bar rows again. Yeah. You know what I use for, so I do a T bar at home. I just take the barbell and I do old school. I just put it in the corner of the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, but I get the V bar and just put it around the bar. You mm -hmm. know, so like the pull, pull down V bar. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah so I just and put it around. Just pull it around. And or I get the rope. And I put around if I want to get like a greater range of motion, but the attachment's probably yeah. way better. Yeah, I was going back and forth with the bench because they actually now have one of those uh, fold down ones from the wall. Like we have, we have in here. It's at first it was just um, I have the fold we're down beta my, testing it. I have the fold down at my house. You do? Mm -hmm. Oh, for the incline? Not the incline one. Yeah, I don't yeah. have that one yet. I have I had the flat one. Yeah, so I had the flat one previous to that. Oh, okay, you had that one. Uh, and uh, so this one, I actually got the freestanding one that's got incline just because I didn't have a whole lot of wall space left with everything I bought. So, uh, yeah, but yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's all set up, man. It's it's ready to go. So I know you obviously could probably pay it in full. You probably did, but did you consider financing it? Because I know they have such a cool financing deal. Yeah, I, I actually did. financed mine. I did finance <laughs> oh, the you first did? Okay. one, not this one. Oh, yeah, okay. This one, I, I just went for it. Oh really? But both of you guys finance it. Yeah, I know you yeah. I know you're like the opposite of that stuff. You I hate pay, you pay, stuff. But you know yeah. what? That's not smart money. If, if especially with inflation and everything, it's actually pretty smart to lock in low interest rates right now. That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, it's super. It's payments. super cheap to. I mean, I looked at it like gym membership, right? It's like yeah. I would be like I'm. I now have made this transition. I'm no longer working out in gyms. I'm going to move into training at home. And so what would my gym memberships cost? I mean, I think it's less than what my gym memberships combined would be. So it was like, and and I don't, so I never felt like I skipped to be, although I think I'm still paying for some gym memberships. So that's, Are you still? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, think I, got, I think I got in with a building. You, just, you got rid of all of them yet? You just no. love the industry so much. I do. That's, that's how I look. That's how I'm going to look at it. Like, I'm just trying to help out, you know? I don't want to them. Yeah, support them. So. Yeah, no matter what, the gym industry for me is like my, that's my, my people, man. So yeah. whenever I hear about a gym like going under or gym try, like I don't know why it always makes me sad. You yeah. Know what I mean? Well, you oh, know what totally. always happens to me is like because I've been in this these phases where I decide either I'm going to switch to another gym or I'm going to cancel that one. Is I I like I would go down. This is what would happen to me. Oh, you know what? I've talked about on the show. It reminded me I'm going to cancel my gym, and then all of a sudden I'm gonna be like, you know, I really want to go down and use you know club sports sauna. 
And I'm like, damn it, I just canceled. Then I go down and I have to re-sign and do the whole thing over again. <laughs> just because I'm in How this... many times have you canceled and re-signed? Oh, dude, I've done that so many times. Uh, so many times with gyms. Uh, bo- both are the Golds, the Club Sport, and the 24-Hour Fitness. I have canceled and re-signed back up at least on each one of those, at least three to four times on each yeah. one. Wow. Did, now, do you have the 24-Hour Fitness, those original, like, $49 a year after you prepaid? No, I have a... Um, or was it the family and friends? Yeah, like no, I, no, I don't even have a good, really good deal. I'm actually paying, like, like normal, which is ironic because we worked there and I could have got, like, a smoking deal. See, that just, I just to show you, when I, I've, I had that deal a long time ago, but I've canceled it and re-signed up so many times that... I'm just whatever the normal. I pay like sixty something dollars a month because I have all club super sport access for twenty four, mm. and then I pay a hundred and I want to say twenty or fifty for the club sport, which is like the spa one that we wow. do, and then I pay another so like, tw- like you're like twenty something hundred bucks a year, and then another thirty four thirty nine dollars for the all, all the golds one. Or Someone the, needs to make a meme with Adam like just like holding money and it's on fire. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, if you find value in it, I mean, that's that's the thing. Well, what will happen is I'll go down and I'll use one of yeah. them, or I'll want to use it, and I'm like, son of a bitch, you know? I, did it I all got in that trap for a while because of the old man uh, gyms that you want, like just the sauna, and yeah. you want, like some of the nice amenities, but you don't really get it, because... I don't know. I still, I still look for that kind of stuff. Like it's relaxing to me. I like being around that. But at the same time, I've gotten used to the home gym for all the, you know, the the meat and potatoes. Yeah. How funny is that, right? As I've gotten older, like when I was a kid, I didn't give a shit about the locker room or you yeah. know, steam and sauna, like whatever. Now I go in a. Can, do you guys have? Yeah, you know? <laughs> I go look in the locker room. Like, oh, it looks like nice. eucalyptus oil in there. Yeah, is, that's yeah. a clean shower. Yeah. I think I'd like. This well, part. I know it happens, I, and I've caught myself doing this as we've gotten older. It's like I'll go, like, oh, gotta go to the gym today, and I'll go do. Well, I'm not really feeling it today, so I go do like two or three things, and then I'm in the sauna for the next hour. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. Yeah. If they had racquetball, I'd be like all <laughs> into that, dude. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm full old man. Yeah, right and now. then I found myself. I haven't done it in a while, obviously, because they had shut it down. And I said, forget it, and I canceled. But I found myself like, I'm like, am I that old guy in the locker room that walks? around naked because i'd go in the sauna and then you know i'm hot i don't really care anymore i'm just gonna walk over there and what and then you know there's like other people in the locker room like i'm that dude now i better yeah. cover myself up put dude. your foot up on the bench just yeah, yeah. You know, speaking air of being an old guy i need I have, to air the air out yeah, yeah. speaking of old guy i have a random question for you guys have, do you guys have have you guys written wills uh, so I have a trust that yeah. we just wrote. I had a trust, uh, but for, not a will. which basically no. is you know. What did you leave me? Similar? No, nothing. Oh, okay. I, I I was just reading. <laughs> I was reading this article, and actually, like from ages eighteen to thirty six, some young age, there's been like a eighteen percent increase of people writing their wills at that age. Just a younger demographic of people that are now writing wills at a much younger age than before. Oh, wow. I just thought that was interesting because you know I'm forty and I haven't written a will, so I was just I was curious if you guys were doing it, yeah. and then also if you had any sort of speculation it's, on why. Well, especially if you're well, not I don't married, want the state to own anything that that's after it. I'm gone. Especially if you're not married. Like so let's say you're not married and you're you know you got your girlfriend and whatever or you have kids and you die, she doesn't necessarily get your stuff. And if your child is under 18, I believe it goes to a state arbitrator, if I'm not mistaken. And then mm-hmm. it goes to the state and it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. So that's when it's a will becomes- to get it. But if you have a spouse, it automatically goes to them unless you don't want it to. Or if you have like children from previous marriages, then it's probably good to have a will because then they can start to fight over what's going on. Or if you're old and you have all these kids. So my, I have a, uh, an aunt that's worked in uh, the banking industry forever. And she's told me, she goes, you would, you would not believe what money does to families. Like, uh, like, the, oh, like, yeah, just, yeah, like, the, like the, the patriarch and matriarch pass away and all their kids, they have five kids, take each other to court and just are vicious with each other and whatever. Mm-hmm. And I can't even, I, it's like terrible. She people, tells are always, people are always surprised at that, but I'm not. I mean, almost every family has the one brother or the one sister, right? Who like, you got like five bro- siblings and then like there's one or two that just don't have their shit together. Yeah. And what they see is that opportunity and they're entitled like piranhas, to piranhas. Well, know, they just, just waiting. they don't have any money and they yeah. haven't maybe made done very well for themselves. And then all of a sudden mom and dad leave a house that's worth a million dollars. That's yeah. a quarter million dollars or say whatever in, in their name. And they're like, and then maybe the other siblings are established, have their own houses and they'd rather keep the but house. You don't deserve it or whatever. Yeah. 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 No, we, we, so I have a friend, I have a friend whose family, so this happened to somebody they knew, right? Where the, the parents died. They were older. And one of the kids was their full-time caretaker uh, 
and had a job, but also took care of them for like the last, I don't know, four years of their life. And so, you know, the, la- the last three or four years of your life as you get older, you know, they can be rough, right? You need someone to help you get bathe up, and- go to the bathroom, bathe, feed them, do all this stuff. So this, their child, their daughter did all this for like four years. The parents told the kids verbally, hey, listen, so-and-so's been taking care of us for the last four years. I would like them to have this much more mm-hmm. when we pass away. Verbally. They died because there was no contract. They went to court and fought over it. And I'm like, what a bunch of pieces of garbage, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then there was one kid who like never visited, never called the parents, didn't give a crap. All of a sudden, they come out of the woodworks. Oh, I don't. I I deserve a full quarter of all that or yeah. whatever. That's why yeah. stuff like that happens. Yeah, but why is- do you think there's an in, like this? I mean, eighteen percent increase in that is like a lot. That's a big percentage. You know, getting close to a quarter of all. That's sudden, a good it, question. I don't yeah, know. Let's speculate. Like, what would what would all of a sudden promoted cause that? Well, Especially when we're with, go ahead. Doug. Perhaps it's the coronavirus. All the fear. People uh, are feeling like uh, maybe I'm, you know, mortal at this mm, point. That's a good point. Just yeah. more fear, right? More yeah, fear I think around so. Everything. And in my comment on wills, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, a living trust is going to be a better option than a will. Right. Because uh, a will, I believe, actually goes through probate probate as well, which involves the state. And that's exactly what you don't want involved. Yeah. And usually you write that up after your trust anyway. Yeah. So uh, so what's the point of even having a will then if you have a trust? Well, the the will will be part of the trust. Yeah, exactly. Oh. It's all kind of incorporated. Mm-hmm. Isn't that and, great? How and they go this through is? like, yeah, if you have kids, like who's going to take care of them, and you have to like, you know, delineate that. Uh, otherwise, yeah, the the state gets involved, and they have to like figure it out. So you have to like, yeah, you have to talk about all the morbid things and, and get that all yeah. covered. Uh, I, I'd say just stay close. You know, be good to your kids and have a good relationship with them so they don't have to deal with all this yeah. afterwards. You know I still I mean? don't think it would matter. I really don't. I, I mean, we've talked about this because Katrina's mom has has two houses and, you know, she's getting older, right? And they have four kids. And one of the houses, like she just finished the the backyard, like the house, this is the house where we all come to and like every holiday yeah. we, and she's built it in just, it just is great for holding and hosting everybody. She's even like, it did like a little memorial thing in the concrete in the back for, um, for Troy. And you know, the, the idea is that this house stays in the family, oh, that I we see. don't sell it or whatever. But that you have, you know, uh, two of her siblings that are just not as established as the other two are, and so two of them would be like, yeah, it's not a big deal. They have their own houses, they have their own investments. Yeah. They make but then good the other money. two might be like, I need the money. Yeah, but then the other two, I, I don't know where they'll be at in ten or twenty years from now, and mm-hmm. like if they really, really need the money, and and some might move out of state, and then it's like, I they let's say they move to you know another state far away. It's like, why would I have this house just sitting there that I never come back and use and visit and so even though they're all very tight and good like that will create a Mm. interesting conversation like well that's yeah i mean that's what you have to all outline but actually the house that we bought they went that was sort of the the circumstance was there was like one or two people oh, the one in you guys the just family, got right now yeah. and oh. they all wanted to keep it in the family but the there was like one or two that voted no like we need you know we need the money or we need to sell and See? so then they all went through this and I think that's why it took extra long because they had to kind of like work all that out and then they ended up putting it on the market and then we ended up, uh, you know, taking the opportunity. Right. So, I mean, even if you have good, like you're in good standings with your siblings, I could see that. I mean, I could even, I could understand even if I, like, let's say I, I was the person who moved far away and we never used that house. It's like, well, what is the point of it staying there if I'll never go back there and ever use it? I'm getting no, and just because my siblings want to use it. And that's you're like, right. It could, de- it, you know, you know it reminds me of your like how many movie plots have been like this where there's like a like a, someone dies or rich, oh, yeah. but then they all have to go watch a video, and this person like if you're watching this video, I died, and I'll give you ten million dollars, but first, you know, and there's like, like some, every murder mystery, like, <laughs> that's it's all, always about right. somebody like you know cashing like on life insurance. Yeah, that's yeah. How, that's how I'll yeah. give you two million dollars. I want to get the estate but money, yeah, but you have to get your biology. You, you have, have to answer. These biology. 17 personal questions yeah. about me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get you to the or second it's like, stage. It's like the old guy, like what was it? Um, ah, what was for Anna Nicole Smith or something like that, where you get like the the new like super hot oh, like young dude. wife of like the the old she married that nine year old guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and everybody in the family is just like ah, and then, like everything was like allotted to her dude, and not the family. Dude, that a- happened. That happened in my family. So my dad, but my dad, my dad, uh, my stepdad, right, remarried and he remarried to a lady who I. Uh, 
want to say is like, and I don't want to get this wrong on in Salter's like 15 years, maybe 20 years older than him. Like, so, That's and, a decent gap. and, and she, yeah, right. And he's older, right? So that she's definitely a, 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 quite a bit older than he is. And they, she has like three kids and she's really wealthy. Like she's said, and like, they like hate him. And of like, course. He, has, he hasn't done anything. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's like and, a real nice guy. Yeah. You know, you're like, my, you're my, you're my stepdad, dude. He's yeah. like a super Give nice guy. You know what I'm saying? But they like r just hate him. Like they, because he's here's this young guy who's marrying. I mean, it's just it's you don't see it as as it's not as common as the reverse of that. But oh, yeah. he's definitely being treated that way from her her, her her kids because she's worth all this money. And here comes and my stepdad doesn't really bring a lot a trophy, to the table at all financially. Husband? So they look at it like, oh, who's this dude who's sliding in at this point in her life uh, who doesn't have anything really financially is now what can be entitled to oh, all her stuff. You know yeah. what, though? The bottom so. line is, it's like, it's that person's money. So yeah. it's up to them to well, decide. That's her if they make bad decisions. That's, that's right. Her, that's her attitude. Fuck them. It's my, it's my money. You know what I'm saying? I could do. This I could give it all to. Leads them if I want to. into like I got pulled back into Tiger King just because. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is all that kind of like drama and like you know the, the white trash sort of uh, uh, like illegal zoo world or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, like it was just the, I was like I gave up on it because it was all just like a recap the first that's why episodes. I didn't even watch it you told me that yeah and so I guess like the, around the fourth or fifth episode I think there's only like five or six episodes uh, like it gets into like other stuff that like you're like oh my god it like took total like left turn uh, so there was so, more parties involved so like uh, so you know how Joe Exotic actually got into prison do you remember if you remember like they did he plotted against Carol Baskin yeah. to kill, right? Yeah. And basically, like the guy that there's like a he was working of him with saying that, or, right? Or from something. Vegas, you know, the the, yeah. the guy that came in to help yeah, him out yeah. as a benefactor. Yeah, Turns yeah. out he's a total slime ball, whatever. Like, so uh, I guess so they basically like planted him with the idea, and then he like proposes it to like his other worker, and then like they they set him up with the FBI. So it goes further and they, they have like recordings with the FBI, basically like this guy from, um, from Vegas, like recorded the FBI conversation that he had saying that he could get his employee to basically set up Joe to Isn't that entrapment. Yes. Yes. And so anyway, they, they all go through these affidavits and they come back and like, uh, acknowledge that. But then his employee, and I'm sorry for not, you know, remembering all their names and this is confusing, uh, but uh, the the employee that basically was like hated Joe the whole time and yeah. like was was setting him up uh, comes out and feels guilty about this whole thing and is like he's like well basically uh, and spoiler like we we were were setting Joe up like we were gonna kill Joe Whoa. and like here's how we were gonna do it and it was like exactly how they basically outlined how they wanted to kill Carol Baskin but it was really originally Joe. It's so he like he like announces this whole thing in in court and like so there's this whole like uh, retrial now or they're 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 gonna see if they're gonna let Joe off with a lesser sentence and then they just leave it at that and there's like there's a couple other they're plot setting twists. it up for part three dude. yeah dude and, and so now it's all about the, <laughs> they all deserve each other it's dude it's just like yeah it's it's, it's what do you remember what what's the time what's it's his, like Jerry Springer dude. what's his sentence do you remember how long his sentence was it was like for eight years or something something like that but wow. so he's he's served two. And then, um, so yeah, it's, I guess it was interesting enough to have like plot twists and there's more of them, but it's really, you know, just more Jerry Springer. Action. More of the it's same, so, right? Like more of the same of wow. these characters just behaving super badly. And this one guy was, oh my God. Oh, 22 years. He was, he was, uh, oh, 22. Oh, it was way off. Yeah. Uh, what a weird, that whole thing was so weird to me how he was able to lure people in and then they'd stick around. Yeah. And like, because he had tigers, I guess money and drugs. I guess Dude, that's the, all you need. The whole thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's not that weird. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> I got tigers, people drugs, and money. People get lured in for a lot less. That's true. <laughs> I mean, that guy from Vegas. I was just was here with the drugs. You got tigers girls. too. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Him I'm, and his wife would like lure in, like, like they would, they would, they called it like Code 69, and they would look for like a hot, a hot girl uh, that would come to the zoo, and then his wife would go approach so her and then pull her back to pet the tigers, <laughs> and then they'd all do like a, a weird like. 
orgy. Wow. Like, dude, what? Like, like what world is I this? Like, I liked my favorite were the were Joe's like boyfriends and husbands. You know what I mean? They're like, I'm not gay. <laughs> I'm not even you know? gay, man. But, <laughs> but $20, $20. Hey, you know? yeah, like, what are you going to do? Math's a hell of a drug. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's yeah. the real thing right dude. there. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> wow. The ultimate bamboozle. What know? a commercial for meth, hey. though, huh? <laughs> Joe Exotic, he's a charismatic dude. It's so dude. awesome. It'll, It'll make you do shit you don't even want to do. Yeah. <laughs> like it, you know? Serious. Wow. Yeah. Hey, so I, this is a total terrible transition out of this, but I, I was reading this other article on like uh, like the top polluters in the world. You know what industry, pol the second highest industry when it comes to polluting the earth is? Uh, now, is this, is this, by the way, are they not putting in the militaries of the world? Does that count? Is all of this, or is that is that are they uh, market industries? Yeah, market industries. Because okay. I know the militaries pollute by far. And what and what is the what goes what uh, what's umbrella underneath the military? Oh like, man, the, all the jets and planes and oh you know, yeah, and rockets yeah. and yeah, it's no, like, this was just like yeah. this is like uh, market industries. Oh, industries. I don't know there. which one. No, take a guess. You guys have a guess. What, what would be one no, of the highest? No, I, mean, I, I saw the notes, so I know what the oh, answer is. You did. Oh, you did. <laughs> I didn't know you saw it. Yeah, but I had a, no idea. The fashion industry. What? Yeah. Okay. I it's guess close. That. Just the amount of. Clothes that we we buy and then just throw away and end up in the factories that produce yeah. Them, so or? there's this huge movement on, and that it was popular even when we were kids, like to to go to secondhand stores and stuff. Mm. So I was watching, I was listening to that other podcast that I like right now, this week in startups, and he was interviewing one of these founders of this new company called Wearloom. And I thought it was actually really brilliant, uh, especially after I heard all these statistics. I, one, I didn't know that they were like a top polluter. And then there's obviously a movement for people to go green and, and reduce yeah. their carbon footprint. And so secondhand stores uh, are becoming more and more popular again. And basically what their app does is aggregate all of the different ones into one single location. So if you're mm. somebody who's looking for used Jordans, instead of you having to go to eBay and to mm. the Goodwill and to all these different locations and places where you would like try- storefronts for those? Yeah. Like instead of going, no, no, there are, it's, a, it's a centralized app. So it's basically, think about like uh, the Amazon- for secondhand uh, stuff, uh, for, or like eBay or something like that. Yeah, well, the eBay's in there, right? So they get they they aggregate all of that, so you can just go to one place and shop for secondhand clothes. Oh wow! Oh, okay. And I just thought that was brilliant with yeah. the one knowing that I didn't know that it was like a top polluter like that, and then it was it, that secondhand stores is already a, a, like a popular thing. Like there's a lot of high, and it does high end too, right? So you can get mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people that buy like Louis Vuitton purses, second yeah. and third time handed down you know you i could, see i can see that a lot like the, the whole shoe thing to me i'm just like unless you're like some weirdo with like a, a shoe sniffing fetish mm. like why would you buy somebody else's shoes did you, did you, uh. you realize you're talking adam's listening to us right now like, <laughs> well there's a lot of people that <laughs> adam's, I'm just adam's saying, a shoe fanatic. Like, like, yeah. <laughs> well there's a lot of people that would buy the shoes i'm wearing right now right so i could actually wear these for the next year or two and i could sell them season for, them a little bit i mean you might yeah exactly <laughs> you might get a guy just <laughs> well what you i mean you uh, get you adam. get less yeah. money for them the more worn they are, right? So you, the idea is depends what, on what article of clothing. We, yeah, <laughs> and, what kind of, <laughs> and what kind of people you're selling nice to. But pick. typically, yeah. right? You want you want Justin's them. In, Chonies, that's just man, where my for, mind goes. They can sell for millions. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> oh, I mean, I've I've always thought the secondhand thing was always weird to me. Like I've never been a big secondhand guy. But there, I remember when we were kids, that was a popular thing for people uh -huh. to to wear secondhand. Oh, I do that with hats the old time. Like it was just weird. We'd like if, when my friend would be done with his hat, we'd like switch hats. Yeah. And then we'd trade and it was like a trading thing that's yeah. how you get like i was just gonna say you know it's funny you say that because you're probably yeah. more likely to catch some yeah. shit that yeah. way than when fucking socks shoes probably you know? but, yeah uh, definitely it didn't smell as bad yeah. Is that, you know we'd share combs yeah. and toothbrushes yeah. and deodorant yeah. Yeah. we share underwear <laughs> yeah, was, we swap underwear he'd use yeah. one side of the toilet paper i'd use the other side uh, yeah. you know we you like guys didn't uh, okay. nah, that's my uh my new podcast um people always ask what podcast listening to uh and that's the host from all in yes that's how i went down the that is such by the way did you know that podcast in such a short period of time is now one of the top, top podcasts. Yeah, like they, he's been announcing the Not last couple shows. They, they do a really good they're job. They're really good. They're really smart and they're really entertaining. And you're looking at, like, you're going to get inside information on investments in very applicable ways. Yeah. I haven't found anywhere else. Yeah, no, I love it. So I, the the host, uh, Jason Calcanis, I think is how you say his name. Uh, he is um, also a host of another. So before All In, he had This Week in Startups. So he was podcasting before the All In podcast. 
and he's also got an investment fund. And what he does is he basically brings on the companies that he's investing in and his group is investing in. And he does these like short little interviews. So it's kind of cool. It's interesting to me right now because obviously we're getting into angel investing, but it's also interesting because I like to hear these cool pitches yeah. on new companies that are like starting up like that Cafe X one. Like you heard about that one, right? I, I did. I, yeah. I don't think I talked about it on the show, but I was telling you off air, like, it's the these robotic like coffee makers or coffee machines where basically it picks up your phone when it's your phone is ninety seconds away. So from as you're it. driving to it, it knows what your order is, gets it ready. You'll get your coffee uh, in way less time, and it's like two bucks, mm. and it's all automated. Well, like the two most high, the highest expenses for Starbucks is real estate and employees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the coffee and all that stuff is very the overhead on that's very very low. So that's not the, the their highest thing is. So if you can eliminate the the real estate piece and the person doing it, you could reduce the cup the cup of coffee to in half. Mm -hmm. So it's half the price for the cup of coffee faster as as good. Like I mean, you, that's going to be amazing. Yeah, I, I think it's br brilliant. I mean, it just eliminates the like. Like uh, that, uh, like the cool part of like for your, sure. Your, well, well, just like your technical order that you want everybody no, to that, hear. So Sal, Sal brought up that, but that was his point, right? He goes, "Oh, I wonder if it'll." You know, his initial reaction to it was, "I wonder if it if it will do that good." Because a lot of people go to the coffee shop for the experience. They pull yeah. their laptops out, and there's definitely. Right. That's a new thing in culture in the last decade or two, right? That's become popular to do that. But that is not- I mean, that part annoys me. I, well, I was actually saying that sarcastically. Uh, you know, like you're behind uh, somebody at Starbucks and they have like the two sugar pumps and then this. And then it's like, oh, oh, it's yeah. so neurotically- half, yeah, half foam, two, two and a oh, half pumps. Oh, I thought you were alluding to the the people that want to congregate in the place. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And actually, because that- Well, that, that is a big part of it too. Because you will lose that. Yeah. But I mean, I think that's such a small percentage of people that buy coffee every day. There's only so many people hanging out. Yeah, there's out a market for fast. Faster tastes good. Yeah, so it's sure. still got to be good. Yeah, yeah that, that market is eighty plus percent in yep. my opinion yep. because it, it, you know eighty percent of the people are not hanging out in Starbucks. Most of them are yeah. going down there. They're buying. We're already addicts. We just want convenience. Yeah, yeah, like, like, yeah. Like, speed. I want my drugs faster. <laughs> yeah. And they're saying like yeah, two dude. bucks. So cup the cups that would be four or five bucks. Talking about it being two dollars. So it being faster. And then imagine them being in like. Like if you're in a downtown area, like kind of where we're near, like they would be in, you know, almost every corner in somebody's office building or whatever. Mm -hmm. So just like how they have like Redbox or whatever for DVDs, you'd have these coffee machines that you would go into the. I think there's a market for it. Oh, I think there's. I a, definitely think a there's a market massive for it. market. And that for same it. robot can wash your dishes and then. Ah, oh, oh, shit. shit! It's now happening. You get, now you're getting out of control. <laughs> oh, I can't wait till that happens. That's a huge. Oh. That's a huge step, though. You know what? He's gonna, they're gonna be like, uh, uh, you know, first robot does you know heart surgery, and he's like not doing dishes. Yeah, yeah that's gonna be Adam yeah. the whole time. Meanwhile, like China that. was taking people to space uh, that were just random people. Just so you guys know, China. Yeah, yeah. They just I did. believe everything China said. Yeah. I'm just gonna tell you right now. <laughs> everything yeah. they say. I don't think China said it. I think we reported on it, but that's happening. So I believe leave us just a little bit more that we say. You know? <laughs> yeah. All right. So I want to talk about something on the show now. I think it's uh, it's it's appropriate. So I'm getting a lot of comments from people uh, about whether or not I'm on TRT and, you know, because I'm looking different uh, these days. So I want to talk a little bit about my process and kind of what's happening. So I know Is you guys know intervention. No, this, okay. So, so, and I want to tell, I want to tell the audience because, um, I feel like it's, uh, important. This is something that we're, that we've been talking about for a while. And it's yeah. also just, I just feel like it's, um, it's appropriate because of all the questions that I've been getting. So I don't know about maybe 10 months ago or so there has it been that long. Maybe, maybe eight months. Yeah. I don't think it's been 10 months. Yeah. Maybe less. Um, yeah. I don't know the exact six to eight, I maybe would six say. to eight months. Yeah. Okay. So it feels like a while. Uh, there were, there's been, we've been talking a lot to different hormone therapy clinics and stuff. And well, ever since I got into it. Yes. Yeah. And the main reason was because of Adam's, you know, because of what you did, right? You, yeah. you were on anabolics for a while when you competed, went off, tried to get your normal, your testosterone up to normal levels. You did that for like two years. And so we're like, this would be a good partnership. A lot of people ask questions about this. So anyway, there was this local clinic. It's not the one we're working with now, and I'll, I'll get, get into that. But they offered free blood testing to everybody. So I know at the time you were like, I'm going to go get tested. Hey, you know, Sal, we should go, you know, if you want it, it's free or whatever. And at the time, I thought, no, waste of time. I don't need to get my my hormones checked, my libido's fine. Well, especially since what less than a year ago we had the at home test and you were like through the roof. It would no, it was more than that. It was like two years ago. Oh, but, it was that long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to get into that too, because yeah. that's a little annoying. But anyway, I one of the number one, I guess, effects of low testosterone is libido drop. 
And if it's below a certain amount, they'll say it's almost like everybody will have this really poor libido and issues with that, right? And my libido was fine. So I thought, man, eh, it's kind of a waste of time, whatever. Anyway, I changed my mind. I'm like, all right, I'll go get tested. And I went and got tested with Adam and I got my results back. So this was, again, like eight months ago or so. And my levels, and this is 100% true, came back not just low, they came back lower than, and, and a, a general practitioner would have recommended that I take testosterone. So well, you, were low, you were lower than me. I was lower than you were. Yeah. So, and you know, if you're watching and listening to this, you're Which probably Which was thinking, mind-boggling for all of us yeah, here, knowing yeah. how, yeah, dialed you, you've been Well, so this is, so now, now, and I'm going to go into why I didn't talk about this uh, right out the gates, but first of all, it's very depressing for me because- I super, and anybody will tell you who knows me, super consistent with my training, my diet, my sleep, my supplements. It's a passion of mine. I'm uh, maybe even neurotic about it. So everything's perfect and dialed in. My number came back at 260, which basically means if I increase my testosterone by 50%, which ain't going to happen because I was already doing everything, red light, I was doing everything, that it would still be low. So I remember I called Jessica and I was super depressed about it. And I'm like, this, this is bullshit. And then everything kind of started to make sense. I'm like, you know, for the last few years, I have not felt like myself at all. I've been feeling low drive. I've needed more sleep. My body does not respond. My gut health has gotten kind of worse, um, you know, on and off. Um, again, the libido part didn't make any sense to me. Well, my libido's okay, but then I compared it to how it used to be. And I just naturally have a very high libido. So I'm like, I guess it is kind of low compared to what it was before. So I talked to the doctor back and forth and... And the reason why I think mine came back low was in my 20s. This is back in the early 2000s. And I've talked about this on the show. There were, um, and they're outright steroids, but they were over the counter and they, they marketed them as pro hormones. So they, they went under the brands like Superdrol, Methyl 1 Testosterone, Halidrol. And these are all active oral steroids that were, they, they, they weren't banned because the legislation at the time was written specifically for known and approved anabolic steroids and testosterone. So they were able to sell them over the counter. So I was buying them and I was taking them, you know, on and off. And I think that's probably what caused me once I hit 40 to really have this dip or, you know, like I said, the last few years have this, you know, low testosterone. So anyway, I thought, I said, okay, I'm going to try it. I don't want to tell anybody. I have, my family doesn't know. So this is one of the reasons why I haven't talked about it on the show. The only people that knew was Jessica, my close, close family. Didn't tell my, my parents don't know. You know, my kids don't know, didn't want to tell anybody. And I wanted to see, you know, what the difference was. And so we started working with uh, regenerative sport uh, and medicine. Uh, the doctors there are extremely knowledgeable. I was not impressed at all with the previous people. When I feel like I know more than the person who's prescribing me mm -hmm. medications, um, then I don't feel confident. I've had this with cannabis We've had people. Yeah, I was say it's very similar to that experience. Yes, we had a person years uh, on the show a long time ago. Actually, we didn't even air the episode. Who was a cannabis expert, and Adam and I were both like, <laughs> "We know more than you do. We can't yeah. air this episode." Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, this this other this other place I was not impressed with. Neither was Adam. We talked to regenerative sport and medicine, and they were they're obviously they know their shit. And I asked him. I said, "Why why was my libido kind of normal?" And he said, well, he goes, there's a lot of things affect libido, not just testosterone. He goes, but what about these things? He's like, are you, you know, do you gain body fat really easily? I'm like, yeah, I'm naturally ectomorph shredded. All of a sudden it's like store more body fat, more pain, uh, super tired. And I asked him about gut health and he said there could be an effect uh, with gut health as well, especially oh, with, as low as I was. So I don't want to tell anybody. I wanted to go on and I wanted to wait and... To go from, and remember, keep in mind, before I talk about my experience with this, I want everybody to know, I was dialed going into this. So it wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't like shitty exercise, poor diet, whatever. I was, everything was dialed always, low testosterone. So then I got my testosterone up to the upper normal limits. And it, it's, I, to say it's life changing is uh, an understatement. For me, it yeah. was com like my quality of life completely mm. changed. And the difference in physical difference for me is about, uh, I, and I tested this, it's about 13 to 14 pounds of lean body mass and about five or s five to seven pounds of body fat. So I dropped five, doing the same stuff, training, yeah. eating, all that stuff. The only difference now is I'm eating more because my lean body mass has gone up. 
uh, I 13 pound lean body mass and I dropped about five to seven pounds of body fat. So how long did it take for you to kind of feel that difference in the workouts? And then, you know, Probably pretty it, quick, it, yeah, in terms of your body responding. So, and I didn't know, and this is what made me really pissed off. What made me really upset was a, it was a, a kick to the groin because I, I had everything set up. So to see my levels come back so low and then to talk to the doctor and, the, and they told me literally your levels are, they're below 300, which is outside the range. And that means you'll have negative health effects as a result of it. So you, you have increased risk of heart disease and Alzheimer's, all that stuff. So you guys know, you know, that's a big deal for me. So I was like, shit, okay. Um, and then the thing that, uh, you know, I forgot the direction I was going to go with that. But anyway, um, oh, here's what really pissed me off. We did those at home tests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple, I had a few. You were hella high. One of them was really high. One yeah, of them one was of them normal. said you were like beyond oh, high. I was like super low on those. Yeah. yeah. Home yeah. Tests. So what the hell, right? Yeah. Like, why would it say that? And I'm wondering if it's user error. I'm doing it at home. How, you know, and that, and that, look, you talk to the hormone doctors, they'll tell you don't do, like those tests, like you have to do blood tests. Yeah. So I think yeah. that this is kind of proving. Well, the worst part about that more than anything else was that because you were normal and high on both the testings that you did, that you just, it didn't even, you didn't, why I- I didn't know what the hell was going why on. Like, was, why do I feel why, so It tired? was useful to me because I was so low. It's what triggered, okay, I need to go get my blood work done now. Like this test is saying that I'm really low. So I could see where some people found value in things like that if it showed you were really low. But man, how shitty is that for somebody who gets tested as normal or high? And so then they don't go and further investigate what potentially could be wrong. Yeah, all them. the signs- if this is hindsight, all the signs were there minus the libido part. And that's the part that I kept fooling myself, but man, I, my energy, my drive, I just didn't feel like myself. I had to really tune everything in with supplement, everything perfect just to make myself kind of feel like, okay. So that, that, uh, you know, that's very interesting as far as how I felt. I, I must be very sensitive to testosterone or I just had been low for so long because within the first, I'd say three or four weeks, the first thing I noticed was my libido went ridiculous. So it was like, and then I'm like, oh yeah, this is what I. That's why you kept coming after me. It was like, yeah. Dude, I was like, well, Justin, well, you're looking good. Why? Well, I want to, I want to add some stuff to this conversation. Um, one, uh, I think it's really funny that it's so taboo to talk about, or it's a big deal. I mean, I've, I've been on the train of telling people what's up since the beginning. Yeah. I also yeah. was that way yep. with marijuana well before anybody was, yeah. um, it's and I and I see it. It's a it's a good uh, comparison because I see the same trajectory uh, happening with uh, hormone therapy as I did with cannabis. And this is part of the reason why we partnered with them business wise. I think five ten years from now it's going to be very just as like we see people are talking about cannabis all the time. You see the clinics all over the place because it's not it's not so taboo anymore. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see the same thing with hormone therapy as we get older, forty and beyond. To me, it's, and Joe Rogan's really good about this. He talks openly about yeah, his therapy he's and just. About it. And I was just listening to him talk about it again about like you know he's like of course I would I'm in my forties yeah and no, my, he's in his fifties now yeah, yeah well yeah when he started I think he was in his forties you know and my my levels are lower than me and if I can take a, a a therapy and have a doctor manage my blood work every every month to two months and check up and keep all my levels optimal and and it's affordable for me like why the fuck it's would a quality I not? of life thing and and um. It, and testosterone levels are dropping regardless. This is the thing. They're going they're going down across the board. There's a lot of things you could do to raise your levels, uh, but there's something else that's going on. This has been well documented. And then, you know, like my history in my twenties, I think definitely played a big role in, you know, Well, I'm not, I'm not I'm not finished telling sure. you what I want why I want to interrupt here is because I'm talking about the business side of this and where where we're going with this and why I really wanted us to partner with someone because I do think that this is the future and you're going to see more and more people that are going to look for this. And I think it's important that instead of you going out and doing the mistake that I made, which is trying to become your own uh, doctor and giving it to yourself and buying on the black market to save a couple bucks and right, trying you know, to find the, the, the cheaper uh, sources out yeah, there. Yeah, hundred percent. I, you know, I, I that's, yeah, that's why we want to, and one of the things too, I love uh, the way we have structured this. So some of the audience, we've only mentioned it once. Uh, the audience may not know this, but we have a private forum that is a mind, mind pump hormones. 
and both Dr. Todd and Dr. Ran come on there twice a month and do a live uh, Q&A. And we had the first one just a couple weeks ago, and it was incredible. Dr. Ran was on there for like two hours. Dude, he went off. Oh, he must have answered 100 questions. The thread was going like crazy. Just tremendous value that you you show me where you can get this, all right? And this is a, a, something free that we are doing for our audience that you guys can join in there. And then you have then you have Dr. Todd in there every day. So if you have questions that you write in there and he's interacting, yeah. just the value of that to educate people on um, on potentially whether they need it or not for themselves and or and what they're not doing is just telling people, oh, go take testosterone. It's like, let's look at all these potential markers. What are some of the things that we can do to do it naturally first? No, it's not about haphazardly putting people. It doesn't work that way. No. It's all medical. It doesn't work that way. And I, I do want to address the whole like, you know, it's like this miracle thing that you're going to do and, and voila, you're going to get all these incredible effects or whatever. For me personally, I was dialed in with everything forever since I was a child. And the only th difference was I went from just obviously for test from testosterone that was super low to now in the upper normal range. And so that was kind of the missing you know piece for me. But I'd always been consistent. What I don't want people to think is that they're going to go and it's going to solve all their problems. They're not going to need to work out. They're not going to need to eat right. That's not true. That's not the that's not the case at all. It's all makes a big difference. You got to do all that stuff. So you're not going to like do it in the moment. Well, our, our, our message doesn't change. It's been the same one. Yeah. When, even when, like we work with supplement companies, it doesn't mean that we would recommend people take supplements over whole foods. You know, the the, the all natural way is the is going to be the better approach yeah. always. And that's why it was actually three years that I was off of testosterone because for three years I tried to do it as best I could myself, and so I wanted to. Let me exhaust every resource that I have naturally to see if I can bring this up to a healthy level. And it just got to a place where, and I was similar, I was in the 200s and the best I could get it up to was about 400 and something, which was better than what I was, but still didn't feel great. I still lo I had lost that motivation to c come and drive to go to the gym. I had noticed body fat. Yeah. I actually was affected libido wise. So I noticed a huge difference in my libido. And after all that time of working on it, I just couldn't, I couldn't get it back up any higher than that. And I didn't feel good. And so it was like, okay, all right, well, I'm 40 years old. I don't, I don't have a problem with doing this now. And so I'm for that. And I, and I'm a hundred percent for educating other people on it because more often I, I didn't realize how much I, I would get DMS around this. When I started talking about the testosterone thing, yeah. I get so many messages yeah. and I don't feel comfortable telling people this is not mm -hmm. my expertise. Like, yeah, I have experience. You just tell them your own personal. Yeah. And, and then that's all, but that doesn't help people out that much either because it's so individualized. Well, so so questions cause it's been so uh, stigmatized and also like there's just people that have, uh, you know, their own ideas of what, what that entails. And it's totally not, uh, you know, accurate information. It's not like easily accessible. Whereas now, you know, like the, the education piece is everything to be yeah. able to bring that clarity. So, you know, if it's a right option. For yeah. Well, that's the, the, that was even for me, the stigma. I mean, one of the, so even I felt, I felt crushed when I got my test results back and I talked to the doctors. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm doing everything. Yeah. I felt that stigma. Like, but I'm a fitness guy. I'm a health guy. Like, how could this be right. possible? And of course, and I mean, it, it, I guess it could make sense if you add all the other stuff up, but still, and yeah, you're right. It's stigmatized. Like if you're, if you're doing things and you're healthy and there are, if it's your thyroid, there's no stigma. Right. Oh, my mm -hmm. thyroid is low, and then you give you thyroid. Oh, I'm I'm much better. Insulin, Which obviously, is a hormone. By the way, yes, so you don't understand that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, insulin. There's no stigma, right? Estrogen, progesterone, no stigma. Testosterone, because if you take ridiculous amounts of it, you have this performance enhancing drug. It's been stigmatized. Uh, hormone therapy is not that, by the way. They will not. They're not going to give you yeah. bodybuilder. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. They will take your levels and bring them up to the you know when you start to feel good, which is typically in the upper normal range or whatever and it's different from person to person and that's pretty much it and i'll tell you what uh and i've told you guys this and uh, you know this is the truth the physical effects cool that's great it's fun i don't care about that as much as i care about boy do i feel different like i felt way more energy way less irritable um tired my drive came back i felt like my old self again which is kind of the best words uh that i can use to describe so, and, and, be, and again, because we're always as transparent as possible to our audience, you know, and we've talked about this for a while and I told you guys, and so the audience knows, I told, you know, the guys, I don't want to say anything yet. I want to hold off. My family doesn't know yet. Let me wait. And I, you know, I don't know how I feel about it, whatever. And I'm private about certain things, but I want to be very transparent. So that's, 
you know, that's been my experience and that's kind of what's going on. Um, and, uh, if, if you're doing things and you can't figure out what the hell's going on and you work with your doctor, like Western medicine is not the solution for everything, but for some things, it definitely makes a huge difference. So Doug, when is uh, the next, the next talk, mm. when is Dr. Todd talking on the forum? Yeah, that's, uh, I believe Monday, the 20th. Oh, this Monday coming up. Uh-huh. 5 oh. PM Pacific. So yeah, so at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time inside the forum, you guys can ask Mind Pump forums. You can Mind Pump forum. You can join, uh, and then it's also on replay, right? So we leave it up there. So if you can't, what's the make, name of the forum? Does it Mind Pump hormones? hormones? I believe no Mind Pump Hormones. It's Mind Pump Hormones. Mind pump it's a Facebook right? group. Yeah. So you just go to the Facebook request access, okay. and we'll let you. And in. now, now yeah. the the previous Q and A that Dr. Rand did is still there. You can watch the replay. The whole thing. Yeah. So all two hours of it. Yes. You can watch it. Yeah, so yeah. And it, look, if, look, here's, I get so many DMs, it's hard to answer them all, but if you have any questions, you know, you want to ask me my, my personal, you know, experience or whatever, you can DM me, I'll try to get to them. But, uh, but that's it. And so the audience knows too, like we, we, this is how we, those that have been around for a very long time, this is how we started our original forum. So I don't know how long it'll stay, um, free. We'll do it for free as long as we can, but obviously the bigger it gets, the more things that we add, the more services we have to pay other people to manage it, take care of it. So eventually it may get to a place where we have to charge for access to it because we're paying others to manage it and run it. But for now, it's you got free access to it. So I would take advantage of it. If you're listening right now and you're not in there, you should be in there. Hey, real quick, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Look, go check out one of our uh, partners, Pathwater. So they make water that comes in these aluminum can bottles that are fully recyclable. But here's the best part: I can, when I'm done with it, I can reuse this bottle as many times as I want. And the water costs about the same as their competitors. So way better for the environment, better for you. They're reusable. We love them. That's why we're working with them. Go check them out. Get a discount. So head over to drinkpath.com. Use the code MINDPUMP and get 10% off your purchase. All right. Here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Andrew from New York. Hey, what's up, Andrew? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call today. You got it, man. Yeah. I got My question for you is regarding intensity. Uh, before I ask, I'll give you a little background. So I've been lifting consistently for about 20 years, but also did quite a bit of running over those years. For the past three years, I've stopped running altogether to focus on building muscle. And since focusing on building muscle, I've been running you know, a number of different programs. And what I'm finding is I'll start each program with moderate intensity in week one, and then I'll be increasing intensity throughout the program. And by around week four, I feel like I'm making good progress but start to feel some pain in my joints. And the pain isn't so bad that I couldn't continue with the program, but what I usually do is just hop to the next program to be safe. Uh, but what I'm feeling is I'm, I could be uh, building some more muscle if I continued beyond week four of the program. At the time I submitted the question, I was on week four of a modified five by five type program, making some really good progress. And again, starting to feel some pain in my shoulders and hips. My question for you guys is, is it normal to start feeling a, a little bit of moderate pain as you progress throughout a program and build intensity? Or uh, if not, I'd be interested in your recommendation on how to fix this problem. It's yeah. a good, good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would use Icy Hot and Ben Gay. Stupid. Just rub it all over. <laughs> stupid. No, you know, here's We're the deal. This is, a, this is actually- Very the, common. This Well, this is the one- um, I love 5x5 five five routines, right? Uh, and, and obviously, that looks very similar to our first phase of MAPS Anabolic, but there's a reason why we phase you out of that after mm -hmm. uh, four weeks. So- um, that's what, that's the, the flaw, I think, in running a five by five type of routine consistently. Cause some people will make the case. It's a great routine just to continue on and you build a lot of muscle, a lot of strength. Uh, but this is exactly what I would see happen with clients is if I kept them in this five by five type of a phase, uh, for longer than about four or five weeks, this is the most common feedback that I would yeah. get from my clients is they would start to feel, you know, some achiness in their knees and their elbows and sometimes their hips and, uh, we would phase them into a, another team. And this is part of why um, we write the, the the MAPS programs like this, where we don't keep you in that phase much longer than three to four yeah. weeks. Andrew, Andrew, one of the one of the reasons why this happens isn't necessarily because a, a five by five program isn't effective or is somehow flawed in terms of you know building muscle and strength. It's really effective at building muscle and strength. But here's what happens, right? You do the same movements over and over again. So you're limited on your movements. 
Now, here's the plus side of that. The skill of strength uh, improves trema- tremendously. Right? Yeah. So you're doing a lot of squatting, a lot of deadlift, a lot of pre- you know pressing. Mm. You're practicing them often, and you're going to get really strong at them. And because you get really strong at them, you build a lot of muscle. But then the the weak, the weak links start to show themselves a little bit. And mm. you, you need to strengthen and work on the supporting structures in order to support this newfound strength and muscle. And so if your technique is off, let's say your technique is off by such a small degree that even a relatively experienced trainer won't necessarily see any issues with your form, even though it looks okay because it's off just a little bit and you're adding you know, 10 pounds, 15 pounds of lift, and you're doing the same motion repetitively, it starts to add up and you start to feel the, the pain in the joints and uh, you know the areas where the stability may be lacking a little bit. So this is one reason why mobility work is so important. Now, I will caution you, don't do mobility work and then stop just because you feel better. When you're feeling the pain, that's already now you're kind of a little too late. Now you're a little bit behind uh, the eight ball and you have to lay off on the intensity, scale down the volume, deload weak, do mobility. Now I feel better. Now I can jump back on. It's got to be a part of your regular routine otherwise you're going to keep doing this you know two steps forward two steps back you know types of uh, a situation so you got and i know mobility you know when we do mobility work and correctional work we're like oh, i'm not adding a lot of weight to the bar i don't seem to be building a lot of muscle but if you really do if you really look at it long term you end up with more strength and more muscle because you don't run into these problems that you're you're running into so if you're doing let's say a four day a week five by five type of routine I would do concentrated mobility work at least twice a week. And then on the other days, priming before your workouts, proper priming. Yeah, that was the direction I was going to go as well. However, I was going to ask you too, like if you were to kind of transition to a different program, what that looked like. Because um, one thing too that I would consider is just moving in different planes and directions. So that's that's really what you're trying to accomplish while doing these mobility moves is still reinforcing, um, you know, that uh, – basically being able to to keep everything stable uh, around the joints and, and those uh, secondary muscles to get strengthened up, uh, to be able to contribute and, and maintain the joints positioning uh, as you're increasing the amount of force production. Because as you're going through five by five, as you realize, you get a lot stronger and you get a lot stronger in that direction. But now any little uh, you know, micro angle that pulls you out, uh, whether it's a rotationally or whether it's side to side, uh, you know, your, your body's going to compensate and overcompensate. And then, you know, this is where a lot of injuries result. You guys got to remember that we have this rapidly growing audience, especially on the YouTube channel of a of flux of new people that are listening every single day. And this is a perfect opportunity to talk about why we wrote the programs uh, mm-hmm. the way we did and in the order that we did. Like a, a common question is, you know, why not uh, MAPS Anabolic Forever or why not why not MAPS Aesthetic right after MAPS Anabolic? Like we wrote them in this order for a reason, for this exact reason right here. So you have somebody who is running a five by five type routine, which is very similar to like a MAPS Anabolic type of philosophy, right? The big lifts, you're mostly in the sagittal plane, right. incredible foundational program to build muscle and strength and your metabolism. That's why Anabolic is the first one. But when we talked about what the second program would be, this is the reason why is because yes, th- that program is incredible for doing all those things, but then the limiting factor is exactly what we're addressing right now, totally. which that is yeah. why MAPS Performance is what we thought was the most ideal follow-up program to MAPS yeah. Anabolic. Otherwise, you're just going to keep hitting walls. Yeah, right. and what- one more thing, Andrew, is that muscles get stronger faster than ligaments and tendons and connective tissue do, okay? So if you add 30 pounds to a lift the connective tissue and the ligaments and all the supporting structures don't get as don't gain that same strength at the same speed or time it takes a little bit longer uh, to build that type of strength so if you're seeing these rapid strength gains and you're not focusing on you know good technique form mobility lateral movement stability and allowing these connective tissues to kind of catch up a little bit you'll start to run into a lot of these problems. I love strength with my workouts. I absolutely love it. I run into the exact same problem you're talking about. Every single, I would run into this yep. often where, okay, here we go. Squats, get, I'm getting near my all-time best. Now I'm starting to feel my hip. Or, wow, my deadlift's doing real quick. Oh, there goes my SI joint. I'm starting to feel it again. 
And so unless you want to keep doing this back and forth type of thing, you got to make mobility and you know a priority and you got to train in other planes. So I would recommend Andrew, and I don't know what you're doing now, but if you don't have maps performance, that yeah, would be the program the I would move. do 100%. And, and you're not going to lose gains, by the way, you're going to get more gains because now you're reinforcing a lot of those weak areas. Doug, that, give the man the program. Does that make yeah. sense, Andrew? Do you have maps performance? I do. I, I picked up the RGB bundle, um, and I, I did run Good performance man. earlier this year. I loved it. Um, is that something I should come back to yep. every yes. now and again? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I would do it after every two or three month like heavy strength muscle building yeah. cycle. And then come right back to your yeah your strength cycle. Well, yeah, I mean, if, he, if he's got the RGB, then what's beautiful is I would I would run it in that order. So yep. it was designed to go red, green, black. So go Red, green, black, just over and over again. Yeah, keep running over. And if you still, and if you... If you're getting tremendous value from performance in the mobility days, there, this is where we all. This is also why we have the show and why we have the forum is to help people modify. So if this is like a consistent problem with you, there is nothing that says you can't when you get into anabolic or aesthetic. Takes take things from the mobility days and build those into the program. Yeah, so, swap out the, yep. the trigger sessions or the focus session for mobility days. Right. Nothing wrong with that. And that that a lot of times that's what clients will find is they got so much value from performance in the mobility days that they're like, Adam, is there anything wrong with me putting that in my trigger days or my focus days on those other programs? I say, absolutely not. That's why we teach it this way so people can modify it for their lifestyle. So I would recommend that you you build those mobility days into the other programs, even though we didn't do it for you. Yeah. Now, Andrew, you said your number one goal is to build right now. Are you at, at all interested in cutting at any point? I've actually never gone on a cut. I consider myself a hard gainer, so I'm you know always trying to be in a, a surplus. Um, you know, I, I would like to continue to build at this point. Okay, and, and here's why I asked that. Okay, I, I was guessing that that's what you were going to say. So, and there's a psychological piece here that we need to talk about, right? So I'm like you. I'm you know I'm hard gainer my whole life and. I, if I could, I would probably want to be in a bulk-ish most of the time, just psychologically speaking. But I think that there's real value in going in a very, very mild cut when you're training in a program that is more like MAPS performance or something mobility-focused. Not necessarily because the mild cut or maybe even maintenance is great for those goals, but rather... When I know that my calories are slightly low, I'm less concerned about the fact that I'm not lifting as much on the bar. Does that make sense? That definitely makes sense. Not only that, but also if you're getting these signals from your body that are telling you that you're achy like this, one of the one of the quick ways that actually a lot of times will help clients is just putting them in a calorie deficit for a week or two because inflammation goes yeah, down. Yeah, inflammation will go down right away, right? If you're in a surplus all the time and you're lifting heavy all the time, that's very very common and just simply actually aside from programming, let's say we stayed in the same program. A lot of times I'll take a client who's maybe loving the program and the results from it and say, Hey, let's actually just do a little mini cut for a week or two. Let's drop your calories below maintenance and follow, keep following the program. Who cares if the weight goes down strength wise a little bit, I'm not worried about that, but talk to me about how your aches and pains feel. And sometimes that alone will actually start to eliminate the pain. Yeah. And, and, and when you go back to your bulk, you'll, you'll be really responsive. In fact, here's, I'm going to be more specific. When you do mass performance, I want you to eat at maintenance or slightly below maintenance or slightly above maintenance. Kind of hover around there. Get out of the bulk and go maintenance slightly below and then every once in a while go slightly above. That way you're out of your head. You're not worrying about the weight too much. Inflammation is going to come down. When you're done with MAPS performance, everything feels good. The lateral movement feels good. Rotational movement feels good. Mobility move, you know, feels good. Then you go into like MAPS aesthetic, throw the bulk on, watch how great your body responds. That sounds like a, a good plan. Uh, do you mind if I have one follow-up question? Yeah, sure. So I actually did decide to con continue on with the 5x5 five five after I submitted the question and uh, strained my pec pretty bad. Um, mm. So I'll be rehabbing for the next few weeks. Uh, once I get back into uh, lifting, would you have any recommendations for how I might modify performance with uh, you know the strength in my my chest again? I'm sure I'll have some weakness there. Yeah, I would just listen to your body. So don't, follow the program work. and go much lighter with the exercises yeah. that you need to, and just focus on range of motion and just listen to your body. That's that 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 would be the best advice that I could give you. You said it's a strain, right? Not not like a tear. Yeah, not torn from the tendon, yeah. just a strain. Yeah. And I tell you, look, look, what we're saying is obviously true, right? If you don't really incorporate, you know, different planes of mo movement and mobility, you're going to make gains and you're going to lose gains because of what just happened. You're going to keep doing this back and forth 
And that sucks. It's a pain in the ass. Like it's much better. It's almost like the you know the tortoise versus the hare fable, right? The the tortoise wins the race because they're they're consistent, and the 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 hare loses because they, they go real fast and they stop and kind of lose their I might perspective. Pull, I might pull some of the barbell stuff out and replace yeah. it with dumbbells. dumbbells. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, pull the bar the pull same. the barbell pressing stuff out and and just replace it with uh, that's a good idea. dumbbells. That'll be that'll help you out. Hey, thanks, guys. I really appreciate the advice there. No problem, man. Yep. Thanks for calling in. Yep. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Yeah, that's a uh, boy. That's a real comment. This, I mean, that's me. Like, well, this is why I wanted yeah. I wanted you guys to address. Like, you got to remember that, right? There's right now. There's probably ten thousand people that have never heard us talk about our sure. programs yeah, right. or whatever like yeah. that. And we then, have no interest in getting somebody great results in a short period of time and then forgetting about them. Right. Our interest is great results all the time. Yeah. Right. We want lifelong. Keep thinking ahead. Yes. Like I, I don't like. It's okay. Great. Well, you got is, great results in two months and then you hurt yourself. Like that's not what I'm looking for. I want people to feel good and move through different planes and continue to progress mm -hmm. forever and really with minimal plateaus or injuries or none would be ideal. Well, you have to know too, like performance is one of our programs that is uh, grossly underrated because if you're somebody who's focused on mainly strength and the way you look, you tend to go like, ah, I like anabolic or aesthetic or these other, yeah. and you and you skip that program. Mm -hmm. But there is a there is a very specific reason why we made it the second program mm -hmm. is because exactly this is because there is there's a, a large portion of our clientele that would be pursuing these goals well, and they would neglect yes. that type of programming and we know that's what's what should be inserted right there for a yep. majority of that's people what I was say. it highlights you know the, what's neglected in your current program and most people that are in the gym like just won't uh, you know come up with a lot of these type of movements in their routine because it really goes out side of that uh, perspective. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. If I had to pick, and this is not true, this is uh, you know general, right? But if I had to pick one MAPS program- You gotta run over that and would, over. That would benefit yeah. the majority of the people watching and listening, regardless of their goal, cutting, bulking, looking good, uh, and I'm talking long term, it'd be MAPS performance. Yeah, and if you had to stay in one forever. That's it. If yeah. you had to stay in one of our programs forever, you are probably the safest running that one the longest. With the most consistent long-term. Yes. Yes, totally. Our next caller is Zeynab from Germany. Zeynab, how can we help you? Hi, guys. How are you all doing? Good. We're great. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this amazing podcast. Listening to you guys is literally the highlight of my day. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, to give you some context, i 21 and I just got back to weightlifting three months ago. And I've been consistently following a PPL split because I'm still excited to go back to training and hitting the gym five or six times a week. And I made significant progress in just three months when it comes to muscle gain. Um, maybe, I don't know, because I have genetic potential or muscle memory from previous training. But lately, I haven't been able to progress with my squats. So I increased the weights for my accessory movements, but my squats are stalled. Um, the only explanations that I, that I could come up with is that my upper body is not as developed and strong as it should be to handle the weight anymore for my squats. So my question is, how do you deal with stalls on compound movements when accessory movements are progressing? Or uh, also, like, do you guys have any advice on correcting strength and balances between the upper and lower body? Can I ask you where your nutrition is right now and where it's been? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm currently eating intuitively. Um, I have celiac disease and I have so many um, allergies, so my diet is pretty restricted. Um, my my protein is high. Um, my carbs are a bit low because I don't tolerate um, grains and stuff, so I don't have that in my diet. Um, yeah, so it's pretty much just whole foods and um, like meats. Um, organ meats and um, some vegetables that I can tolerate, some fruits. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, um, just for the gut stuff, have you gotten tested for SIBO, by the way? Uh, no. Okay. No. I would recommend that you you find yourself a, a good gastro um, doctor and, and ask them for a SIBO test, so that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's common with people who have kind of intolerances to grains. It's very treatable and it can make a huge difference. I'm somebody that has done this 
and it makes a big difference for me. But let's talk about the, the question, right? You're talking about squats. There could be so many reasons why your squats are not progressing. So I'm going to ask you a few more questions, just get a little bit more information. Um, what are the rep ranges that you're training in? How often are you squatting? Um, and are you, what other auxiliary lower body movements are you doing? So, uh, my rep ranges are between six to eight, um, five sets, five working sets. Um, yeah, I think I'm like, I'm trying to focus on my form. So like, I don't want to compromise the form. So once like, I, I feel like, um, it's like, I don't have a good form. I just like uh, stop immediately. And, um, I'm squatting twice, a, twice a week and with some variations uh, squat variations on the third day sometimes are you doing split stance exercises like uh sl yeah. lunges and bulgarian uh, what about hip yeah. thrusts yeah i okay. hip thrust okay so it could be that you might need to change your program yeah how long have you been running that yeah. six to six to eight reps how long uh three months oh now. yeah there, I, there I would go i would change that i would definitely change that that rep range you might need to go through a few weeks of a Higher rep, yeah, higher rep range. I would love to see her do anabolic and start in phase three. Yeah, that could be that could be really good. Um, have you followed any of the MAPS programs? No. Okay, we'll send you MAPS anabolic. Um, and you might want to start in phase three and then go backwards. Phase three, two, and one. Do the three foundational workouts a week and then and then do the trigger sessions on the off days. But it's you know, it's it's typical that your body will will stall in a lift. After about you know eight to twelve weeks is is usually when you'll start to see if plateaus are going to happen they'll start to happen around there. Changing the rep ranges is a really easy way to get things moving again. Like if we got you to focus on fifteen to twenty reps, you're going to have to go way lighter. It's going to be really exhausting. But after about four weeks of doing that, you're going to feel like you're getting good stamina and strength. Then you can go back to the lower rep ranges, and then within a couple weeks, you, you'll probably start to see the weight move back up. Now, as you stalled, did you notice any real sticking points in the lift that were obvious? Or is this more just, you know, you, you got fatigued during your sets? I just get so fatigued, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, this, so that advice would apply. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll go even further. Like, I would I would love to see you run MAPS Anabolic, which will send that over to you in the order Sal said. So start in phase three, go to two, then go to one. Then I would love to see you follow that up with MAPS Performance, run it in the order's design, and then follow that up with MAPS Powerlift. If we're talking about getting yourself a badass squat, I'm hearing, I'm hearing what you're telling me right now where you're kind of stuck in a plateau and how you've been training. That order of programs, uh, watch where your squat is at in three yeah. months. And she's a, she's a college student. Why don't we give her all three of those? So that's MAPS Anabolic, Performance, and Power Lift. You're going to be set, actually. So the advice we're giving you, you don't even have to remember it. Just follow the programs the way that we're explaining, and you should see your body really start to progress um, pretty consistently. Yeah. Right out the gates, we're going to switch you to a, a total different rep range by going to Anabolic, Phase 3 first, 2, and then 1. So that'll be good for you right away. And then we'll address some mobility, unilateral work, and performance, which is going to – and you, so initially, maybe you won't see the squat go way up right then. You may, but you may just hover around just taking care of the body like you need to. And then when you go into MAPS power lift, then you'll start that, to break some Then PRs. you're going to start to hit yeah. PRs. Yeah. You'll, you're, you're, just make sure you keep us informed when you hit that you know 400-pound squat. That's right. <laughs> what, are you squatting? what are you squatting right now, by the way? <laughs> Fingers crossed for that. Thank you so much, guys. No problem. Zinni, Zinni, real quick, what are you squatting right now? Just to, just for out of curiosity. Uh, 50 kilograms. Okay, so like uh, 120 pounds. Yeah. That's right. excellent. How much do you weigh? Uh, around 145. That's really and good for time. yeah. That's really good yeah. for six to eight reps. That's a good so ratio. yeah, Especially I, I think we'll be able. Form. I think we'll be able to get your squat uh, 30, 30, 40 pounds higher uh, within that period of time. So let's see what happens. I hope so. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, excellent. All right, cool. Let us know what happens, okay? Okay, thank you so much, guys. Have thank a great day. You too. All right. Thank you. So I, lo I love the international callers. Yeah. yeah. Great, hey, right? similar to the kind of the last caller, you know, is stuck in that, you know, five by five or low rep range for an extended period of time. You know, when you're when you're so hung up on on being strong, this is the this, I think this is the Achilles heel to chasing strength. We always talk about totally. how, why you should do 100%. that. Hundred percent. It is good for people that have 
body image issues and stuff like that, but this is the Achilles heel to chasing strength is you get so hung up on adding weight to the bar and it gets exciting when you do that, right? You keep getting stronger mm -hmm. and stronger that you stick in that routine too long. And then the last thing you want to do is go like, oh, I've been crushing five by five. Oh, and now I got to do 15 reps and I got to cut my weight. Yeah, my by weight's down by 50%. Yeah, you know, yeah. this is, by the way, this is the Achilles heel of any program that works. Mm -hmm. You do something that works really well for three months, you are stubborn to move out of it. Oh, yeah. You don't want to leave. No. Because it's working. You yeah. know? And then when it doesn't work, it's panic. Yeah. So, yeah, you just got to stay ahead yeah, of it. Yeah. I, I used to stay in a plateau for like four weeks before I'd finally get it through oh, my I thick would, skull. That I was would be time to move. I would yeah, be dude. longer than that. It would be longer than that. I would stay in the same program and training modality way too long. Really? I think, yeah. And that's why I think we're so adamant about talking to that yeah. because I think, you know, here we are trainers. We have the knowledge, the information, yet- even we're guilty of doing this. So you know most people are. You get you get a little bit of momentum and seeing results. You like it. You enjoy it. And then you just stay in that 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 phase, that routine just way too long. Yep. All right. Our next caller is Elliot from California. Elliot, what's up, man? How can we help you? Um, well, I've got a question about testosterone levels. It's uh, kind of a lengthy one. So if I start rambling, feel free to cut me off. But I recently got lab work done and my test levels came back at 320 nanograms per deciliter. For reference, I'm 25. I train regularly. I eat fairly clean and I get about seven and a half to eight and a half hours of sleep. My general practitioner says I should focus less on the numbers, more on the symptoms. Uh, this is difficult me, for me though, because that's more qualitative than quantitative. Uh, that being said, couple symptoms are lower libido than years of recent past. Body fat and strength are both going up gradually. To me, this is kind of a paradox. Um, I get incredibly tired early in the day. Usually I'm asleep by 8.30. Um, but again, it's hard for me to tell if these are true symptoms, though, due to not having an accurate way to measure over time. And then on the quantitative side of things, I've looked at a few studies, but not many stratified data by age, which kind of sucks. I found one study that took a convenient sample of 10,000 men. And from that, I fall around in the bottom decile. Uh, being someone who likes to optimize things as much as I do, hearing that I'm in that bottom decile at this age sucks. If you were in my shoes, is there anything you would do to get your test levels up? Or do you think being on the lower end of normal is adequate? And yeah. uh, thanks again. Yeah, what, no, that's a, a good question. What a nice way to present that question. Yeah, yeah. thank you for all that information. I, first off, I, I do want to be clear. None of us are uh, hormone experts or doctors. Right. Okay, So we're going to talk from the fitness and health. Oh, I am. So I'm just <laughs> hormonal sometimes. Yeah, that's yeah. all. Um, I, so things that can typically affect testosterone, not enough uh, fat consumption, calories too low, lack of sleep, stress. There can be environmental factors. Testosterone levels have been declining generally in men for a while now. I mean, I, I tested very low about six months ago uh, myself, but I'm not 25. So, so I, again, speaking just from my experience at your age, first off, what I would do if you're looking for advice on hormones is I would go to a specialist, right? So your general practitioner has very minimal knowledge when it comes to hormones, especially testosterone. Testosterone has been demonized for so long that doctors are just, they, they tend to stay away from that it. That being and, said, though, his GP gave, I think, pretty good advice to him, which is don't focus so much on the number and focus on the symptoms, symptoms which yeah. is the same thing that Dr. Rand would say to him, too. They do, but here's the thing. 320 is, you're right above what's considered the bottom part of the range. Right, so he may right. not, the GP may not recommend testosterone therapy because of yeah. that. But, but also because of your age, so there may be other things you can do to jumpstart your testosterone, both uh, behaviorally uh, and maybe you know medicinally, there may be things mm. that you can use to kind of jumpstart them. I, if I were you, I would, and and I wish I did this earlier. I would go and speak to a expert in this particular space. Uh, we work with regenerative sport and medicine. They're really good. I think the website is mphormones.com. So you can go on there, set up an appointment, and and talk to them and see what's going on. Elliot, are you in our forum yet? I'm not in the forum okay. now. Okay, it's free, at least for now it's free, uh, and it's unbelievably valuable. In fact, uh, Dr. Rand spoke for the first time. So what we set up with them, this is what this is for our audience, because this is becoming such a popular question, uh, we set up a, a, a free private forum for people that have questions around hormones twice a month. Dr. Rand or Dr. Todd get on there and do live Q and A's. We keep them recorded on there so you could actually go on there right now and watch the last one. He went for two hours answering questions and okay. very, very detailed. And the more information you can provide him, like you like that question was so good. If you gave him those like that exact question, he would be able to give even better advice 
uh, than what we could give you. And I, I'm with Sal. I recommend that you go talk to somebody like that who is mm -hmm. an expert in that field and can answer all your questions and potential concerns. So go take advantage of that. And if you guys are listening to the podcast right now and you have similar questions around this, this is why we created this forum is so you guys could get this free information. Yeah, and, and, and there's, it's much more complicated too than, and this is what I've just learned in the last you know few months, it's more complicated than just the total testosterone. You, you, free testosterone is more important. And then there's androgen receptor density. Like some, you know, you could have one guy with a, a number of testosterone that's lower than another guy, but he feels so much better because he has more androgen receptors uh, that are available for that testosterone. So that's why they say focus on the symptoms. Let's talk about the stuff that, that we now can advise you on. Okay. So let's talk about your workouts for a second. Let's start there. What do your workouts look like? How many days a week are you lifting? How many days a week are you doing cardio? What does that look like? Right. So lifting four to six days a week and a modified push-pull legs routine uh, and cardio. I know you guys are going to yell at me for this one, but uh, only a couple times a month. And that'd just be uh, either Stairmaster or walking at an incline for about 30 minutes. You said a couple times a month? Yeah. Not, yeah. Not, yeah. not a lot. That's fine. I don't care about that. So, okay. So let's have you lift full body three days a week. Let's, let's go there. Okay. That's yeah. Give him anabolic. Yeah. I'm going to give you maps anabolic, follow that program that three day a week, two to three day a week, full body workout in my experience with the clients that I have worked on who have monitored their hormone levels typically is the most effective at getting testosterone levels to move up. Now here's some good news. In my experience, I've worked with clients who've come had low testosterone or lowish testosterone and through lifestyle, we've been able to get it to improve by a good 30 to 50%. So that's a pretty big jump. Yeah, that's from, huge. From where you're at now. So so those are, that's something you could do. And then you could also try, you know, things that are a little bit more fringe, like red light therapy. There's yeah. definitely science that supports that. It, if you're not getting enough sunlight, especially, that's yeah. something to consider. You could get, I don't know if you got your vitamin D levels tested. If that's low, then your testosterone. I'm taking D3 and zinc okay. to try to supplement that as is. Okay, good supplementally uh, herbs that can help. Ashwagandha has been shown to raise testosterone in men with low testosterone. It's a bit temporary though. It's not this like long-term permanent effect, but for workouts, I would start there. I would go away from the four, six days a week, go three days a week, full body that uh, at the very least, even if your testosterone levels don't you know, go up, it'll work better with what you're working with. So you'll see probably okay. better gains anyway. And then talk to a hormone expert. It's like, you know, if I had, um, you know, really, really, if I needed knee surgery, I wouldn't go to my general practitioner for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I would go to a, a, a specific surgeon that focuses on the knees. So don't rely on your general practitioner when it comes to hormone advice. Again, especially testosterone. It's so yeah. demonized. They're so afraid of even learning about how to utilize testosterone with people that need it, that the information you're going to get is going to be, is not going to be very but good. But in terms of our wheelhouse, if you're checking all the boxes of, you know, lifting weights and getting adequate rest, getting adequate sleep, you're getting sunlight, your nutrition's dialed in, you know, those are the things that you can manage and see, you know, where that leads you. You're still struggling. Definitely go seek, you know, uh, a specialist at that point. Yeah. But we're going to give you maps anabolic for free. And Elliot. get in that form, Elliot. What we'll do. Appreciate that, guys. One final question on apart from the three days of lifting, um, is there cardio uh, strategy that you would recommend most or program? I mean, if you're looking for lots of endurance and stamina, yeah, you probably want to do it a few days a week. If that's not really that important for you, I would just monitor your just daily activity. Yeah. Well, so, how active are you at work? Uh, sedentary, sit in front of four screens okay. all day. Okay, if you, so if you, it probably helps. Yeah, if you moving. went on a walk for 15 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you that would be enough. That would be good enough. Okay, okay. Good to know. Thanks Thanks for all the input. No problem, man. Thanks all for right. calling. All right, take care. You know, I, I, I don't want to get on, on a soapbox here, but uh, it is- But you're going to. Yeah, I am anyway. <laughs> Just kidding, Grant. Yeah, did you see so, how you did that right I there? Know. <laughs> I know. I don't want to do this, but I'm going to. Hold. The This hormone issue in men is starting to get to a really interesting place. Bro, it blew me oh, away. Yeah. It blew me away when I first started talking about on the show, the amount of DMs that I was getting from 20-year-olds. Mm-hmm. And it, these weren't just kids that are like looking to take steroids. These are kids are that, that went and got their blood work I done, know. was concerned about how low they are, 
And I, 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 I did not see this when we were in gyms. When we were training in gyms, it was this was not a common question. Mm -hmm. This has become one of the number one questions I'm having with people in my DMs right now. And I would have never seen that coming. This is this is not, but this is not our, our opinion, by the way. This is well oh, documented. Goodness. This is we've documented this now since the nineteen, I think, seventies. This gradual and consistent decline. So it's much more common. So what does this mean for you? It's accelerated. What too. does this mean for you if you're watching or listening? If you have symptoms of low testosterone out of nowhere and it's not going away and you're doing all the good, the right stuff, then you might want to talk to a specialist and at least get tested and see what's going on. Now, here's the other side of that. If you're listening and you feel great and you have no symptoms, I think it's still a good idea to get tested so you have a baseline. Because let's say you're feeling good, everything's great, you get tested, your test comes back, it's, you know, let's say 700 nanograms per deciliter and you're like okay awesome and then let's say 10 years later you feel like total garbage can't figure it out you go get tested it comes back at 350 you know oh that's really low for me uh, I, you know i tested before at 700 so it's a good i, I wish i got those baselines when i was in my i 20s. told you that katrina uh, uh katrina's mom made all of her kids do that i thought it was like one of the smartest things. so smart yeah, yeah she said when you guys and they tell like do it when you feel great don't go well, don't go wait to go get yeah, tested you don't when, know what the what yeah it, go, it compares go, to if you are a person who's like oh i'm fine i'm optimal well, okay if you're fine and you're optimal go get your blood work done so you have a baseline to refer yeah, back to smart. because in 10 years from now when the inevitable happens and it, you're not perfect you can now give that to your your therapist and say listen this is this is where i felt amazing this is where my levels were and where am i at now and how can we get my get me to there yeah and the, the part to me that was really revealing when you really learn and, and dive into this is again the stigma around testosterone like if your thyroid is borderline and you have all the symptoms of low thyroid doctors are typically okay with giving oh, you a yeah. little thyroid if you're Obviously, if insulin's you know down, they're going to give you insulin or estrogen or progesterone. They tend to be pretty open to that. But testosterone's been so demonized, which is interesting because it's one of the safest hormones that you could administer. Um, it's so demonized; they're so afraid. So even if you're like one, you know, point one above the lowest, you know, measure on that scale, they're they're really reluctant to that's talk because, about. That's it. because nobody goes and takes 10x the thyroid medication. That's why. Mm. That's exactly. Mm. If people were taking 10x thyroid, you mean like as a performance enhancing yeah, drug? That's oh, I mean. yeah. oh yeah. Oh like, yeah. That's hundred like, percent for abuse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The potential for abuse is extremely high when it comes to. But you know what? Even along those lines, if you took 10x of any hormone, that's what my point. You would kill yourself. That's my point. Yeah, my, not point my point. My yeah. point is the if you were you know it gets demonized, but the irony of that is something like thyroid medication, which is readily prescribed or prescribed all the time. If someone went out and did 4x that, and so that the, all the fear around testosterone is the 4x 10x that's right if you take if your doctor gives you your testosterone and you says hey take 200 milligrams a week and you go take a thousand you know yeah. but you now fall in a different category but if you stick to what he tells you it's just as safe as a thyroid yeah but i it's 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 hard to hear this from young men because that's a really tough situation but there are other alternatives i have had clients in their 20s like this and they didn't want to go on testosterone and so what they did is they went on other medications to kind of jumpstart testosterone along with some lifestyle changes. And they actually had some pretty good Well, success. I don't think if you're in your 20s, I don't think your your first or even second or even third option should be testosterone. You should try yeah. and look at all the other things that are affecting it first. Otherwise, you're just masking the root cause of why why you have you could that. Be, yeah, for you're sure, not yeah. naturally producing it at that point. I mean, that's something that should be a little bit alarming. Right. Our next caller is Mac from Indiana. Mac, what's happening? Hey guys, how you doing? Good. Uh, so I had some, I was looking for some advice on how to combat the feeling of not doing enough in the gym. Okay. Uh, so some context, I uh, just started MAPS Aesthetic and, or not just started, getting through uh, phase two here. And on these focus sessions days on my smaller muscle groups like triceps and traps, I feel like I'm just not doing enough during my time in the gym so tell me tell me mac a little bit about your athletic background that i know you have uh yeah so i was a d1 swimmer yeah. in college uh just recently graduated in may so i'm very much accustomed to the 20 hours of 20 hours a week of working out it's like six days a week two hours of practice yeah um yeah, I, I've so trained. That's, that's, I've trained a couple highly competitive swimmers i had no when i first started training one years ago i had no idea the amount of frequency and volume of training at that level. It was twice a day, right? You did like twice a day for First hours. Thing in the morning. 
Yeah, I mean, it'd be, yeah, it'd be a double probably twice, maybe three times a week. I mean, just a lot of, a lot of volume. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So let's, so let's unpack this for a second. Okay. What do you mean when you say that you feel like you're not doing enough or let's say you feel unsatisfied? Like, what do you, what do you mean by that exactly? Uh, like if I, like if it's, if I'm doing triceps, it just feels like only doing three exercises of three sets just isn't enough, I guess. Like, I just don't feel uh, like I've, I've done anything. What, what does enough feel like to you? A uh, little bit sore, uh, maybe not, not like too sore, but you know, uh, I guess just, um, satisfied with it. I get like, I feel like I've, I've done a good work and I've, I've put the work in, I know, I guess, but, but like with, but what does that feel like? So yeah. we, this is important that we, I know we, what Sal's figure, fishing for right now. Well, I'm not even <laughs> fishing. I just want to know what you mean because oh, you're fishing. Yeah. You'll because I want to know what it feels like to you. And, and maybe you don't even, maybe you haven't even put words to this, but this is really important uh, to break down because there's an upper limit to how much exercise your body can tolerate. And then there's the best amount that's going to get you the best results. And they're not the same. So there's a there's a, a volume and intensity and a frequency that's going to give you the best results. And then up above and beyond that is what you can tolerate. And you get diminishing returns, but you can tolerate it. You can get away with it. And so I need to know what feeling you're looking for because if it's, you know, and this is important because if you feel like, you know, I just, I feel like I can do more. Well, that just means that you're used to training your upper limit of tolerance, not optimal, not optimum for results. Nothing necessarily wrong with that if you're willing to trade results and progress for that feeling. Well, so, also keep in mind too, when you're when you're a competitive swimmer, you're trying to get great at this sport, right? Like you're not trying to build the most muscle or burn the most body fat. So if you're approaching weight training with that same idea, well, yeah, we could totally scale up the volume of, of how much exercise you're doing if you just want to get better at exercising. But I'm assuming that you have goals like I want to build some muscle, I want to be stronger, I want to lose body fat. Like, if you have goals like that, it's uh, there's a much more scientific approach to how you do that and what's optimal for your body to see the most amount of results versus how much can I actually do in a workout that I'll actually be able to tolerate. Like Sal saying, those are different things. And when I train comp highly competitive people, it's really hard for them to make that switch totally. because that's how they have approached training for their sport for so many years and probably had success if you made it to D1. So you're, you've learned to do that and push yourself to that level. But when you're actually training to build muscle or to build strength or to lose body fat, it's a it's a total different approach than just how much can I can I do now? Where's where's your intensity gauge through these sets? Like, are you placing more demand on the load? And and after you're done, you feel unsat. Like it feels hard on your way through, but you just feel unsatisfied because you don't have that sore feeling after you get through your sets. Yeah, um, I'm more putting more emphasis on the total reps. So I'm trying to hit that 20 rep range on the, yeah. on these focus sessions. You, you know, um, you know what, Mac, um, sorry to interrupt. Okay. So here's one of the challenges. I'm going to, I'm going to go through this because this might be something that you're thinking. If not, definitely people watching in the same position as you are, are, are thinking this, you competed at a very high level and you trained at it with an extreme volume. And so the argument tends to come back and say, well, if it doesn't work, then why was I training so much and competing at such a high level? Well, here's why. Okay, here's why swimmers and divers and gymnasts in particular train so much. Now, you don't see football players doing that kind of volume of training. It's different. But mm -hmm. you see highly skilled sports do incredible amounts of volume and frequency. And here's why. Let me ask you a question, Mac. You are, you're, you obviously know how to swim very yeah. well. How much of a difference does per, does perfect technique make in your speed when you're swimming I mean, everything that's everything I mean, right it's... like you can have somebody who's less perfect but way more powerful and they'll get creamed by the guy next to him who's got the most perfect technique with their swim right uh yeah this is true for diving and gymnastics as well now that volume and frequency and training the reason why they're training you to the point that you can maximally tolerate is because what they're really looking for is perfection and technique and execution. And the more you practice, the better your execution gets. Even if you sacrifice a little bit of strength and recovery and stamina, 
that's worth it because it's all about skill and technique. Now, when you're working out, Adam said something great. You want to be the best at working out. Well, then just go ahead and do as much as you could possibly tolerate. But if you're looking for strength, aesthetics, mobility, muscle building, fat loss, you're going to have to change your mentality. It is not the same mental state as mm -hmm. the D1 competitive swimmer that you were before. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and help you here because it's hard to get out of that. So here's some advice. Yeah. When you're in there doing your focus sessions, do your focus session. When you're done with it, do something else. You don't have to leave the gym. Why not do more mobility work or technique work or skill work or stretching or other types of activity that can help facilitate recovery, can improve maybe your skill or work on mobility. But what I don't want you to do is keep lifting weights because it's just going to take away. Again, unless you don't care about the results as much, then I'd say go and push yourself until you hit that limit. But if you really care about results, don't do more, but you can do other things that can help out. And, that and to be honest, Mac, and I don't know if you started here, but already like what we've learned about you already and if you were an actual client I would actually make your ass do map, maps in a ball yeah. which would really fucking drive you crazy okay, this, is the, this, <laughs> yeah, this is where I would have gone like, yeah. yeah more of the one to five rep range uh, to really shake it up because this is a completely different pursuit and you have to kind of I mean this is this is a very challenging mental uh, task in front of you is to really kind of shift that attention into what builds you the most strength and not necessarily what you're used to in terms of the feel of this physical activity. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny. The irony, Mac, yeah. is that MAPS Aesthetic is one of our higher volume programs. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, 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 that's why I picked it. I was like, oh, yeah. Exactly. I, I know, exactly. I know that's and it's like nothing it. for you. So yeah. it's like you got to yeah. do something different. Yeah, yeah, I know that's why you pick. Are you in our private forum? No, I'm not. OK, but. you're going to need coaching. Yeah, this is not. The, but OK, the hardest people I ever trained were people like you. So, yeah. and it's hard because it's, you have that mentality. It's there. It was really effective for you. It's going to be really hard to get out of that. So I'm going to bring you in our, our private form. Give us updates, tag us and give us updates so that we can keep talking sense into you. Cause you're going to keep veering into this lane. It's just going to keep happening. I promise you. Yeah. I would love to yeah, see abs you. Absolutely. I would love to see you. Why don't we give him maps and a ball too? Because I'd actually like to see him do maps and a ball, like, as much as it'll drive him crazy. And the thing that I, if you were my client, that might be too much of a jump. That's dude. all right. Though, <laughs> and if you were a client of mine and I was talking to you every day, I would actually be it's making good medicine. Dude. I'd want it's you to do long rest periods. And we would just like, I'd make you sit down and yeah. you'd be chalking up and we'd be talking about the squad. And like, oh yeah, that looked really good last time. Now next time. And like really analyze Analyzing your he's movement just be sweating and technique, he's so antsy. Yeah, and ah. and and making you sit and rest for those full he, three he, minutes. You fire you and hire the CrossFit coach over there <laughs> yeah. and all the, all the circuits and shit. But I, but I would, I would, I would, I would make you do that, and then and and let's just let's just focus on getting stronger and stronger and giving yeah. yourself these these long adequate rests. And it would, I know it would drive you crazy, but I know it's what's best for you. And that if I could get you to commit for a couple months of trusting me. Um, I think that once you saw the strength gains and the muscle that would start to come on your body, yeah. I think that I, I could get you bought in. But it's it's breaking that uh, those old behaviors uh, that made you such a great swimmer. It's it's you don't want to be just great at working out. I think you want to probably build muscle or get stronger. Those things are probably where you're. I'm assuming, right? I mean, I guess we should clarify. Yeah. That. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mac, yeah. Mac what yeah. when you were competitive? So were you were you more of a sprinter, uh, medium distance or long nah, distance? No, I was the distance kid. You were the distance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Now, nonetheless, yeah, so nonetheless, I'm going to say this. Uh, if you got to D1 for any sport, you've got better genetics than 99% of anybody watching this. If you do everything right with what we're saying, you're going to get amazing results. So if your results are lackluster, you're probably overdoing it. That's what I'm going to guess. You're probably overdoing it. And I so. would, and I would say, um, what I would get my my competitive athletes do is to just is uh, let's channel that that crazy discipline that you have, mm -hmm. and attention to detail to other things like the the diet. Like let's let's get like really crazy about really tracking the food and paying attention to how your body and strength is changing and like shift that and mobility like get really good at mobility moves maybe take something from like our our uh, maps performance program and like practice mobility moves and get mm -hmm. really good at that like find er other areas that um, you can get hyper focused on and and take that competitive uh, mind of yours and channel it where it's mm -hmm. going to benefit you channeling that that into more volume and intensity. And training is only going to hinder you so that you've got to shift away from and find something else to, to focus it on yeah we look forward to seeing you in the forum mac gotcha right on man All right. awesome thanks for calling in yeah i appreciate it yep 
in an, in another life, uh, Adam was a D one swimmer. Yeah. Remember that time we went to the pool and yeah. he, just, yeah. he did really well against it. Out all of a I, you know, it's I, I, I'm telling the truth now. I, there are obviously general categories of clients that we've worked with. The most challenging were these, especially when they were only like five to ten years out. Highly competitive college athletes, for sure. Because it was they're successful. It was so hard to get them to pull back. It was it was easier to get the couch potato to start moving than it was to get that person to pull back because. They're in it. They have another gear. Yeah. They're very comfortable in that gear. Yeah. It brought them success. And I like to explain the whole thing about skill and technique because certain sports, the goal is is to push you to your absolute limits because it's about practicing this. Like you look at a diver, they're going to practice as much as their bodies can handle because every little, you know, if you're off just a little bit, you're you're not going to be as good. It's not about getting a stronger, you know, yeah. improving. They're, the they're refining, they're sharpening. You know, that's definitely part of the process. Practicing these moves and really getting really good at it. And so that's the difference, right? Is to be really good at all these exercises. But like, if you want to make a substantial change, you have to really do something different than you've been doing the whole time. Yeah, totally. Look, if you like uh, Mind Pump, you'll love MindPumpFree.com. Head over there and check out all of our free guides. We have guides that can help you with all of your fitness goals. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 